Hey, folks. You know what uh, time of year it is. It's April, the fourth month of the year. And eventually, we're going to get to the 20th day of the, uh, the fourth month of the year. What does that mean? Starting today, April 8th, ending April 22nd, it is sunsetlakesabadays.com 420 sale. 30% off of everything on their website. Use the coupon code 420. It will apply automatically. 4.2% 4 of the proceeds will be donated to the Last Prisoner Project. And this program, the Majority Report, will match that 4.2%. Orders over $100 get a free 20-count jar of Vibe Gummies. That's what the Tats say, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, last year, thanks to all of you, Majority Report listeners, specifically SunsetLakeSebede.com, and the Majority Report helped raise $22,000 for the Last Prisoner Project, a nonprofit organization dedicated to cannabis criminal justice reform. Sunset Lake is running it back. Starting today, everything on Sunset Lake Sabaday. Dot com 30% off with the coupon code 420 again if your order is over $100 they'll throw in a free count uh 20 count jar of their vibe gummies sunset lake is going to donate 4.2% of the proceeds from this sale again to the last prisoner project and we the majority report will match that uh folks they got great products i've talked about it many times smokables keef uh pre rolls all sorts of gummies. I just popped one right now, actually. It's a focus gummy, but they have melatonin. They got uh, great tinctures, some with melatonin, some with a couple of different types of oils uh, that they call good night oil. That's the one I've been using a lot lately. Um, but they also have Sebede Fudge, Sebede Coffee. Uh, they're a great company, um, great business practices, movement partners. Um, they have raised, again, I mean, Last year alone, it was 11000 for the uh, Last Prisoner Project, another 11000 from us. But they have sent, uh, spent thousands of dollars on strike relief funds and, um, and mutual aid and uh, food pantries and Planned Parenthood, um, uh, carceral uh, reform, refugee resettlement, just an all-around great company. And now is the time of the year, folks, 30% off with the coupon code 420 Sunset like Sabaday.com. And speaking of that show that I had mentioned earlier, now is that show that we're going to do now. As I was referring to, the majority report will start. Well, it's not casual Friday, folks. It is, uh, but we may have to play that. It's not casual. But this is really Monday. This is really Monday. This is, in fact, Monday. This is Monday. It's Monday. But of course, this is Monday. We just had a technical problem. It is Monday, April 8th, 2024. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, David Masiatra, author, lecturer, and journalist based in Indiana, author of Exerbia Now, the Battleground of American Democracy. Also on the program today, Israel pulling troops from Khan Yunus for rest before a supposed assault on Rafah. Meanwhile, Israel allows 330 aid trucks into Gaza yesterday and apparently is now allowing bakeries to open in northern Gaza and uh, for water to flow. 
just in case you are wondering what it means to be in an open-air prison or a ghetto in occupied territories, you need permission to open a bakery. And pressure mounts on Biden. as even Nancy Pelosi signing a call with others in Congress for weapons transfers to be halted. Meanwhile, Biden introduces a new student debt relief. Republicans to attempt to send Mayorkas impeachment to the Senate. And Donald Trump tries to split the baby on abortion. Supports <laughs> abortion bans for states that want them, which is what we have now. Harvard non-tenured teachers vote to unionize. Mike Johnson to unveil Ukraine aid package this week. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Oh, also a uh, full eclipse today. Oh, yeah. If you live in the right place, other places uh, will see a partial eclipse. But more uh, than that today on the program. Um, first off, I should also say, uh, Emma Viglund, it's Hello. Monday. It is Monday. Yes. We just had a bit of an Perfect. issue with the file for our, for our uh, intro song. So, you know. Eclipse Day Monday. Right. Um, as a public service... Um, I didn't realize that I would actually have to say this. Don't look at the eclipse unless you are wearing the specific eclipse approved glasses. You can see in a, there's a, a rating on the glasses. You cannot have you cannot use sunglasses. Um, you can use the old pinhole uh, trick, but uh, go and make sure that you have, you know, uh, there's I'm sure you can find one on a website. But I didn't realize I had to say that. Till Bradley was like, I was just going to look at it for like 30 seconds. <laughs> you will, you, you, and I don't understand this, frankly, other than the fact that like. <laughs> I don't think he said 30 seconds. I mean, we got we, we to be fair, fair to him. I think he I said a half look, a second. I was going to look at it though. 30 seconds? Maybe not 30, but I was going to. He's going to do the it. Trump. Yeah. Oh yeah, I just mean. Just glance at it. I can look I, at it. All right, maybe I was. snapshot with your mind as I, it burns under your retinas. Scratch that. We should not be fair to him. That Ouch. was that was. No, not he didn't you... know that you couldn't look at it. Now, <laughs> like I've I've I've, 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 I've always been enough. a little bit baffled as to why. I guess the idea is that like you're able to look at it because it's partially blocked, but when it's not blocked at all, obviously you can't look at the sun for very long because it, it's so bright that it. But I just don't understand. I've never understood why it's that dangerous, but I just know it is. Like, I mean, is it the, because it's like a partial? You can see the partial sun? Why doesn't that hurt well, it's your eyes? It's blocking the center mass, like the sun, the, the most direct rays from the sun. And so those are the ones that basically Go tell right. you to close your eyes. <laughs> yeah. And the other ones are the ones that just sort of like burn a hole into it that you don't really feel. It's more like a sunburn uh, than, than a... Um, Right. Uh, then, you know, like a, a heat burn. So and if the sun had been normally out, right, with its full uh, in its full brightness, your body you, would tell you to look away. Exactly. Uh, but not with an eclipse. I, I uh, the only analogy I have is that I've been told that if you're if you have uh, raccoon poop and you don't want to move raccoon poop, uh, you know, you got to be careful when you move it because it can um, some uh, bacteria can go into the air. Mm hmm. And I've been told you spray it with uh, bleach, but you want to use like 10% bleach because if you spray it with, with straight bleach, Hold on, I'm taking notes. it closes up, it closes up very quickly and doesn't kill the bacteria. Oh. 10%, uh, you know, it, it, it gives it time to, to seep in. Mm. That's what I've been told. Wow. Sentient raccoon poop, kind of. They seem, it well, seems to know what it's doing. Bacteria. Well, damn it. Um, Science is not my strong. Be careful. <laughs> yes, someone just says uh, the um, eclipse glasses from uh, Amazon and other sketchy places. You know, you got to be careful. You know, uh, because you do you you. There's a lot of dicey, um, you know, no. counterfeit stuff out there. Business people wouldn't do that. It's amazing. Saul and I went around yesterday to like every place we could in our neighborhood. And as soon as you'd walk in, you'd say, excuse me, this is a weird question, but do you have, and they'd go, no, we've had a hundred people ask and we've sold out. Mm. I went to one guy and he's like, no, you know, he said no. And then he's like, I, it never even occurred to me to get them. And he's like, why would you, you know? And I said, well, he's like, why wouldn't you go, uh, you know, 
maybe if you go to, you know, some other place or you get them on. And I said, well, I want to go to a reputable place. He said, maybe you can buy, buy them in Chinatown. I said, yeah, but I'm not, I'm a little bit nervous because I want to make sure that they're high quality. That's why I came to this place. Mm. And he goes, oh, thank you. And he goes, but I would have just bought them in Chinatown if he was going to resell them. So that was a little disturbing. Hmm. Um, all right, let's get to uh, the news. <laughs> this is not the April Fool's show. The astronomy report? Yeah. Sorry. The eclipse is on everybody's mind. Um, uh, Donald Trump uh, delivered a little message today on the uh, Truth Social, which incidentally lost about something like 15% uh, of its value overnight. It's almost like their evaluation of it as a multi-billion dollar yeah. enterprise may have been a bit self-serving because Donald Trump owns over 50% of st uh, the stake in it, and he needs some money. I got news for you, though. Here's the good news, is that we, if we apply the same valuation uh, metrics to uh, this show... Um, Come on, invest. Multi-billionaire. Let's take this uh, public. Hello. Uh, <laughs> this thing is worth billions in yeah. terms of what we have not lost. Um, here is uh, Donald Trump. This is a very... The, the, Trump and the Republicans know that abortion is a real, real problem for them. Um, every election since Dobbs has gone uh, against the grain in a massive way uh, against Republicans. And Trump is out here basically trying really just appeal to uh, suburban women in some of these blue states or, or purple states, you know, something like the Pennsylvania, the yeah. Wisconsin's. And Arizona, uh, the North Carolina, the Arizona, the Arizona. And Florida are going to have it on the ballot. I mean, not that Florida is going to, I don't think, turn blue, but it is the best situation Democrats in Florida have been in and down ballot. It'll affect. Well, so. Arizona, I mean, this is where it's going to th this is why he Arizona is not going to help him at all, right. actually, with this statement. But it's places where it's not on the ballot that this this is what he's hoping will help him, which is basically just saying status quo. They're pushing the IVF. But again. Let's be clear. The IVF, to say that you are in favor of IVF and that you think that um, uh, uh, life begins at conception, I'm sorry. There, there's no, you cannot reconcile those two things. It, it, it shows that for the most part, the vast majority of these people are unprincipled about it. It is really just an electoral thing. There's a huge swath of the American public 20, 30 percent who thinks that people should go to jail if they've uh, if they get an abortion. Um, but Donald Trump is he's just lying to people. But here it is. Under my leadership, the Republican Party will always support the creation of strong, thriving and healthy American families. We want to make it easier for mothers and families to have babies, not harder. That includes supporting the availability of fertility treatments like IVF in every state in America like the overwhelming majority of Americans, including the vast majority of Republicans, conservatives, Christians, and pro-life Americans, I strongly support the availability of IVF for couples who are trying to have a precious baby. Precious what could baby. be more beautiful or better than that? Today, I'm pleased that the Alabama legislature has acted very quickly and passed legislation that preserves the availability of IVF in Alabama. They really did a great and fast job. The Republican Party should always be on the side of the miracle of life and the side of mothers, father, their beautiful babies, and that's what we are. IVF is an important part of that, and our great Republican Party will always be with you in your quest for the ultimate joy in life. Many people have asked me what my position is on abortion and abortion rights, especially since I was proudly the person responsible for the ending of something that all legal scholars, both sides, wanted and, in fact, demanded be ended. Roe v. Wade. They wanted it ended. It must be remembered that the Democrats are the radical ones Not on this exactly position true. because they support abortion up to and even beyond the ninth month. The concept of having an abortion in the later months and even execution after birth, and that's exactly what it is. Execution after birth. The baby is born, birth. the baby is executed after birth is unacceptable. <laughs> pause it for one second. I just want to uh, jump in here to say 
That's a lie. Fact check. Um, and the last time I heard that claim, it came from Lynn Cheney. Liz. Uh, Liz Cheney. Sorry. Close. Yep. One of the uh, the, the Cheney uh, former congresswoman. Right. And uh, it wasn't that long ago that she was saying that. What was it, 2019, I think? But so, uh, just to be clear. but uh, Before she gets her MSNBC gig. Exactly. <laughs> I just want everybody to remember that. She also said, Democrats want to kill babies after they're born. Yeah, and also when he's talking about, you know, what the Alabama legislature did, it's not really having the desired effect. Um, I, they reaffirmed their support for IVF after the Alabama Supreme Court struck it down. Um, but that there's still the me the message is so muddled that hospitals are still stopping their IVF procedures in the wake of it because they're like it doesn't the law is not clear. The state Supreme Court says one thing and the legislature is saying another. And and this is also the same with exceptions uh, to abortion bans, which he's going to talk about in a second. Most everyone agrees with that. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both. And whatever they decide must be the law of the land. In this case, the law of the state. Many states will law be different. Part of Many the land. will have a different number of weeks or some will have more conservative than others. And that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. You must follow your heart or, in many cases, your religion or your faith. Do what's right for your family and do what's right for yourself. Do what's right for your children. Do what's right for our country and vote. So important to vote. At the end of the day, it's all about will of the people. That's where we are right now, and that's what we want, the will of the people. I want to thank the six justices, Chief Justice John Roberts. Okay, we Clark. don't need to hear any more of this. I mean, it's just the... Uh, so basically, he's saying, um, if you live in a state, uh, they can take away your individual right uh, to have sovereignty over your own body. I mean, um, maybe we should also leave it up to the states of which ones want slavery. Right. I don't know. Make it the law of the land, the or in this case, the law of some parts of the land, the states. The land. I mean, have spoken. every state will have a different president, too. That's the other thing. Um, this is, uh, first off, let's just be clear. It's a lie. There's absolutely no doubt it's a lie. If Republicans control the House and the Senate, there is no way in a million years Donald Trump is going to veto an abortion ban. And if you don't think that Mike Johnson is not, in, uh, is not the Speaker of the House to pass an abortion ban, you are out of your mind. Granted, there's other things, too. He wants to probably get rid of, uh, you know, uh, divorce, or at least uh, the ones that are chosen by any women. Um, but there's, uh, you're out of your mind. Uh, secondly, from the perspective of this just leaves us exactly where we are with Roe v. Wade and, um, and Dobbs. There's no change. You're going to have abortion bans uh, around the country. It's going to get increasingly uh, intense. They know. They know. The, Amer they, the, Amer the American public does not want this abortion regime. They know the majority of Americans want abortion to be legal. They know a majority of Americans believe that um, people who can get pregnant have a right to have sovereignty over their own body. They know this. And they are trying to figure out how they will slow walk it. Or how they'll lie. They did, they've lied about this the entire time. First, it's states' rights. When did Lindsey Graham introduce that 16-week abortion ban? Like, within months after Dobbs? And Trump's lying now. Yep. Until, you know, he, he said a few months ago that he had a similar idea for legislation on the federal level in terms of a 15, I think, or 16-week abortion ban. They lie until they get elected, and then they deliver for the evangelicals that got them there. Here is, uh, pop, pop up this uh, um, Politico um, uh, sheet. The, this one here. Um, support for abortion access has grown amongst Trump uh, demographics since Dobbs. 
all people, it's gone up by 15%. People over 65 by 17%. Wow. Even with conservatives, with twenty with 2020 uh, Trump voters, with the Republicans, it's all gone up since Dobbs. This is support for abortion access. Those so are, he yeah. knows he's got a problem. Now, right. the we don't know what amount of those people are going to vote based upon abortion. It's probably not very many, but you don't need very many. And they don't need, they might stay home. And they might stay home. I mean, we, yeah, we don't know how much, how important this issue is. We just know that their perspectives on this have changed since abortion access was restricted. And I would bet, although I haven't seen the cross tabs on this, the vast majority of those people in those columns are women. Nikki Haley voters, maybe? We don't know. But Donald Trump is out there, even if it's just a fraction of, uh, of those people, those new people who are supporting uh, abortion rights, decide to act upon that in terms of their voting. Donald Trump's in trouble. That's why he came out with this, and that's why he came out with it now. He has a little bit of problem on his right flank. Put this up. This is the... Um, the only people who are honest about uh, their abortion uh, uh, desires. Uh, this is uh, put out by the Susan B. Anthony thing. Can you? Uh, we are deeply disappointed uh, by in President Trump's position. Unborn children and their mothers deserve national protections. Uh, you got to shrink it. I can't and, see. That. And national advocacy from the brutality of the and abortion. national yeah advocacy from the brutality of the abortion industry. The Dobbs decision clearly allows both states and Congress to act. Marjorie Dance Felser, president of the Susan B. Anthony Pro Life, told the CNN in a statement. I mean, gross. It's also Marjorie. Oh yeah, Marjorie. Sorry, and. Uh, Saying the issue is back to the states cedes the national debate to the Democrats who are working relentlessly to enact legislation mandating abortion throughout all nine months of pregnancy. Now, I just want to be clear. Democrats are not mandating abortion throughout all nine, uh, nine months of pregnancy. We would have no more children born if it was a mandate. It's a bold policy. Uh, it's... There's certain people I think it should be mandated for, but uh, we'll, we'll hold off on that. Uh, if successful, they will wipe out states' rights. With lives on the line, SBA pro-life America and the pro-life grassroots will work tirelessly to defeat President Biden and extreme congressional Democrats. Look, I hope she's right that the Democrats are not working, uh, are working relentlessly to enact legislation, not mandating abortion. You should not be forced to have an abortion. I think that I, I think we can all agree that goes too far. Um, I take maybe maybe select the most left wing person here. I have to say we should mandate abortion. There you go. <laughs> okay, maybe we can strike a middle ground and have executing babies after they come out. Well, that's the secret with the uh, climate change legislation too. That's that's buried Shh. in the Green New Deal mandates abortion for everybody, but uh, and not just in the beginning, but all nine months of the pregnancy. <laughs> now I don't know how they get to nine, month nine if you're being you're mandating abortion sure. at uh, month one. Abortion, but nevertheless. Maybe maybe they're not geniuses, but they certainly have been successful in uh, getting the you know a Supreme Court that w has basically revoked the f first time ever an individual right that has existed for fifty years in this country. Um, like I say, I hope she's right that the Democrats, if they get into the position, they will legislate um, that uh, abortion is a right across the, the the country. But this is the the jam that Donald Trump is in. And I hope it hurts him. And expect him to pick a woman for a VP because of this, by the way. That's my guess. Really? Oh, I mean, I think Christy Noem should be the betting odds favorite. I think that's probably a good guess. Although, yeah, I think that's probably a good guess. But the, the problem is, you know, there is a, a there's a cuckoo and a, a, a COVID. He may not want to go that full COVID denial, but maybe he would. Uh, folks. In a moment, we're going to be talking to David uh, Masriatra, author and lecturer, a journalist based in India, uh, Indiana, sorry, author of Exerbia Now, the Battleground of American Democracy. Um, first couple of words from our sponsor. Um, 
Well, I don't know if people were aware of this. You guys were aware. But about three weeks ago, I tried this product uh, that allowed me to essentially fast for right. five days. I wasn't, I, I wasn't, it, it, I was fasting, but with, with, with food. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the uh, benefits of fasting. Obviously, a little bit of late, uh, weight loss, mental and physical performance. There's um, uh, uh, some research that shows that it, uh, if you fast in, in certain ways, that it can help you with longevity. Um, but the difficult part, of course, is you're not eating. And that is um, extremely difficult. <laughs> yes. Um, but that's why Prolon was created. Prolon is a revolutionary plant-based nutrition program that nourishes the body while making cells believe they are fasting. It's researched and developed for decades at the University of Southern California Longevity Institute. It is backed by leading U.S. medical centers. Prolon helps promote healthy blood sugar, which I'm becoming more and more convinced that is uh, like the, the key. I mean, sugar is just so bad for you. Uh, but... Um, you can control your blood sugar. Uh, it supports cardiovascular health and it reduces uh, abdominal fat. Belly fat's the worst kind of fat in terms of your, your health. But Prolon is not a diet. It is, uh, Prolon is science. It is science based on Nobel Prize winning discoveries in medicine. And this all starts with Prolon's five day program. Snacks, soups, and beverages all designed to keep your body in a fasting state. It is unlike anything you've ever experienced. It was uh, crazy um, because, and I think if you go back, what was it, like three or four weeks ago? Do you remember when it was? Two weeks ago you were doing? Three weeks ago? Yeah, no, I think it was more than like three or four weeks ago. But I did it. I did it. I started on a Sunday night. I did it all the way through. It was right up leading up to Saul's birthday. So it was the first week of uh, March, actually. So about a month ago. And um, I actually felt great. I mean, it wasn't super easy, but it was much easier than I thought. And I reduced my calories dramatically. Uh, and it puts your body into a state goes well beyond like a keto ketosis. Yeah. Um, and I actually felt really good. And it's something that I think I'm probably going to do twice a year now. I want to do it. Um, and, you know, look, it's not the easiest thing you've ever done. But I can tell you, it was their balance of, of, of food, and it's not, it's not that much. I had almost a nervous breakdown one day when I couldn't find my one little uh, crispy snack. <laughs> um, but it, it, is, it is possible. It's doable. And I felt actually really good throughout the entire experience. Um, thousands of doctors now recommend Prolon to support healthy blood sugar and cardiovascular health. Uh, if you have any interest in fasting, this is something to try out. Right now, Prolon is offering the majority report with Sam Cedar listeners 10% off their five-day nutrition program. Go to prolonlife.com slash majority. Very set up in such a way that you don't have to do any thinking. Five boxes within a box come day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. Super easy to follow. It's, uh, it's the best way to do it. Uh, check it out. That is um, prolonlife.com slash majority. You will get 10% off. Also sponsoring the program today, you got to eat well, you got to sleep uh, well. And uh, sleep is so important. We got the weather finally uh, turning a little bit, but and I love summer, but uh, one of the things I do not like about summer, or I used to not actually, was that uh, it just get too hot. And uh, I, I sleep hot. Cozy earth bedding regulates your temperature uh, because their sheets are made of viscose, which is a, um, am I saying that right? Viscose? Close, I think. Viscose? Right? Viscose. 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 Um, which is basically uh, made from bamboo, which is incredibly sustainable because it's a, it's a weed. Uh Thanks to Cozy Earth for sponsoring this episode. They're offering uh, you up to 35% off at CozyEarth.com. Enter Majority Report at checkout. Cozy Earth luxury bedding, like I say, is made with, um, with uh, viscous from bamboo. It's 
to weed. Um, they've got, uh, on top of the bedding, which is uh, excellent stuff and uh, also very durable. I've had sheets that weren't wearing out over time. Uh, I know you got a duvet. Mm -hmm. I've got the joggers and the uh, sort of like lounge wear. I guess it may be yoga wear, but lounge wear, the joggers are amazing. Um, but all their stuff is great. They've got uh, towels too, bath towels. Um, like I say, cozy earth bedding, naturally temperature regulating and breathable. You're going to feel uh, sleep more comfortably all year round. Comes with a 100-night sleep trial. So you've got 100 nights to sleep on them, wash them, try them out. If you're not completely in love, just return them within 100 days. You get a full refund. All of their products also include a 10-year warranty against defects. Whether it's luxury bedding or their ultra-comfortable loungewear, their plush bath towels and more get cozier with Cozy Earth. If you have never tried Cozy Earth, I've got some very awesome news for you. You can save up to 35% off of Cozy Earth right now. But hurry, this offer won't last. Go to CozyEarth.com, enter my promo code Majority Report at checkout for up to 35% off your first order. That's CozyEarth.com, promo code Majority Report. CozyEarth.com. Okay, quick break. We come back. David Mastriata author and lecturer journalist based in indiana author of exerbia now the battleground of american democracy we'll be right back We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Want to welcome to the program David Masiotra. He is a lecturer, a journalist uh, based in Indiana, author of Exerbia Now, the Battleground of American Democracy. Uh, David, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Um, and I just been told that the uh, guest book is a uh, book is not the link is not working. So we just got to fix that link. We, of course, uh, linking your your book. Um, but let's start with just define for us. I mean, it's interesting uh, timing for your book to come out because there's a lot of talk right now about rural uh, voters. Mm. And um, there's a couple of books out there and there's, you know, there's, I've seen some like back and forth in terms of like, um, how do you uh, characterize these people? Is it rage or is it just resentment? Um, but you're talking about the exurbs, which seems to me to be uh, maybe more on point. Um, we, first off, define for us the exurbs, both like from a positive standpoint, but also in relation to rural and suburban. Of course. Uh, yeah, it was a big worry when I wrote the book that the mainstream media would start to get the story of Trump supporters and what's driving them right. And then I'd have nothing to talk about. But of course, that's not happening. So I have plenty of opportunities such as this one to define exurbia. Congratulations uh, to you. Um, uh, too bad for the rest of us, I guess, on some <laughs> level. But, uh. um, which exurbia differs from suburbia in uh, density and distance. So taking those in reverse order, an exurb is a town of greater distance from the nearest metro area, but with fewer people, so less population density. And this is very important because Trump's support is off the charts in exurbia. Uh, and also the most psychotic members of Congress. So lovable characters like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates and Jim Jordan, 
represent districts that are predominantly exurban. And that's quite different from the picture of rednecks and rubes, the little red hat boys that the media likes to discuss obsessively, uh, because the Wall Street Journal reports that median household income in exurbia is actually 15 to 20 percent higher than median household income across the United States. So it's it's a resentful uh, later stage of white flight that's driving people out of cities and out of increasingly diverse and sometimes even progressive suburbs into the exurbs. And they're creating these enclaves of uh, MAGA, mega churches. Uh, there's typically no local media, so they're getting this All right, well, digital let's, Before poison. we get in, I want to get into some more, uh, just uh, some more demographic stuff before we, we get to, to sort of like the, like, so um, the, this is area that is on the outskirts of cities, I guess, in the metropolitan area that was formerly rural areas. Um, when was the development of these areas, like uh, uh, temporally? I mean, if if the suburb if suburbia like really exploded in the fifties, I guess, and we had uh, in the sixties, um, we had this sort of white flight. Not sort of. We had this white flight from the cities to to sort of build up uh, suburbia. Um, w when when was exurbias uh, or ex urban areas um, uh, built up? So from the the mid to late nineties to the present. It's still an area in growth and development, but it really started to take off uh, in the mid to late 90s. And what was it that drove people there? Were they coming from, were those folks coming from the rural areas and moving closer to the city? Or was it uh, people uh, leaving the city or leaving suburbia? No, they were planned community, communities for people live, leaving the city and leaving suburbia. Mm. Uh, and so real estate development firms built these areas up and they could do so and offer lower property taxes often uh, because you have new infrastructure, you have less of a need for police, firefighters, school teachers, librarians. So uh, it was white flight drove people out of the suburbs and out of the cities and a desire for isolation drove people to those areas, but then uh, some, some some financially advantageous circumstances acted as a magnet, strengthening that attraction. Um, and give us a sense. I mean, you said that they're ten to fifteen percent um, wealthier than the the in the average uh, across the country. Where are they relative to suburbia and to? Because I would presume suburbia is going to be the wealthiest, right? Except for some urban areas. Although from an average standpoint, I don't know how that works out, right? Because you have uh, probably pockets of extreme poverty uh, in these cities and, and, and uh, you know, uh, swaths of, 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 of real wealth. Where are they relative to suburbia and to rural? Well, that's an, they're definitely wealthier than rural areas. And many of these areas used to be rural. So they used to be where the, the trailer parks were located. Uh, and you know, desolate outpost. But then these planned, these real estate development firms build up these areas. They become planned communities, and they begin to resemble suburbia, uh, particularly middle class and upper middle class suburbia. The suburban landscape has become more varied. So if you take where I live in Northwest Indiana, I, and I grew up in the South Chicago suburbs, uh, many of the towns of my youth that were middle class. Uh, have now descended into poverty, uh, or at least uh, gone down a couple of ranks, economically speaking, uh, whereas other towns have grown, and typically the towns that have grown are those uh, in exurbia or closer to exurbia. Yeah, I can picture, honestly, the town, the, these developments that you're talking about, you know, I had family living in a kind of town like that in Pennsylvania, right, where it used to be middle class, began to decline, but there's all these developments and kind of cul-de-sac areas where all the houses are newly constructed and it fits the mold that you say where it's upper uh, or it's middle class people moving in. And then eventually I would say there's this, it, there are some upper middle class people who are small business owners, which I'm curious about if that was a part of your analysis. 
there was in the wake of January 6th, there were a lot of people saying, well, these are just the working class people. It's the cry of the working class attacking the Capitol. And then weeks in the weeks following, there was some analysis done where it goes, a lot of these folks flew in and a lot of these folks own a pool cleaning business in uh, Missouri or they uh, have uh, some sort of, you know, small financial business in uh, Indiana. And I think that that fits quite neatly with your analysis of some of these Trump voters. Yeah, that's a crucial point. Uh David Brooks and his brethren gave us this asinine definition of the working class, that it's just someone without a college degree. So if, if you're going to think and act according to those terms, an elementary school teacher making 30 grand a year is not working class, but a small business owner or a tradesman making 80 to 90 grand a year is working class. That makes no sense but it tends to be that latter category. So as you're saying, Emma, small business owners, but also people who do relatively well in the trades who populate these exurban towns and consistently support Trump and consistently support people like Jim Jordan and Matt Gates. And some of the research into January 6th is really fascinating. So for example, the number one common characteristic of people who stormed the Capitol uh, is residency in an exurban county uh, where the non-white population is growing and also where the black-white poverty gap is shrinking. Uh, and people who've looked at these, uh, you know, these, these wannabe aspiring fascists uh, have concluded that it's primarily culture and identity and resentment and hatred surrounding those issues, not economics, because they're not working class by any sensible definition of the term. So um, wh where are these people working? Like if you're out in that sort of like, uh, you know, netherworld, like, who, like where are they? You know, if I was to look at a, a typical, you know, five or three typical ex-urban uh, folks, like are they... Are they working remotely? Are they going in? Are they work for insurance company? Like, who is it that they they work? What kind of jobs do these people have? How often are they going into the city, or do they just work in suburbia, or are there are there are they working in exurbia? So they tend to work in suburbia. So you'll have people living maybe say sixty miles, seventy miles out of Chicago working in suburban towns that are 15 or 20 miles out of Chicago. Uh, and as I was saying, they tend to be in the trades. Many of them own their own construction firms or uh, own their own electrician company, uh, a plumbing company. So there, there are people of that nature, you know, petty bourgeoisie, uh, who are going into the suburbs where they previously escaped. Usually they used to live in these suburbs. That's where they built their business. That's where they began to earn their living. Then they fled to Exurbia, but most of their customer base and clientele still is in suburbia. Interesting. And um, let's talk about the, uh, the mega churches because you also uh, write that this is um, maybe not coincidentally um, where we find the vast, overwhelming majority of megachurches in the country are in these type of like uh, geographical areas. Yeah, that's very interesting because it began as a practical matter. If you're going to build a church the size of a basketball arena, it's probably difficult and costly to do so. Well, not probably, it is difficult and costly to do so in an urban area or in a densely populated suburb. So it was exurbia that had the open space and also the cheaply available land and the low uh, property taxes, although that's a different matter because we're talking about religion. Uh, so the mega churches sprang up and then they act as a magnet for people who attend these mega churches because many of them tend to be quite devout and they want to move closer to their source of community, the institution that they attend and from which they gain some sense of belonging and purpose. Uh, so then they move closer to Exurbia 
And in many of these exurban towns, they don't have much local government. I mean, they do in, in nominal terms. Uh, they don't have many third places in the classic sociological sense. It's a lot of corporate chains. Uh, but what they do have are mega churches. So the mega church becomes uh, the daycare, the source of political news and perspective, uh, the, the source of social and recreational life. And I mean, I don't have to tell your audience why that's a big problem, because many of these mega churches, uh, at best, they preach the prosperity gospel, uh, which is destructive and insane. Uh, but at worst, they become citadels of Christian theocratic nationalism. Um, also, the uh, thing that you mentioned is that there is a preponderance of casinos in these areas as well, mm -hmm. and which also makes sense for very similar reasons, I guess. You need at least the ability for employment that you would pull out of the suburbs. Uh, and, you know, these people are going to drive 30, 40, 50 minutes to their work at the casino. But you want it out there where you're... you're um, uh, where you have actually the land, and I would imagine in some instances will also be on uh, on indigenous people's lands as well. Yeah, there are two areas where we've seen casinos grow. So we're, the conversation is taking on like a people of faith theme, mega churches and, and gamblers. Uh, but post-industrial towns uh, that take a gamble, pun intended, on casinos to revive their struggling local economies, uh, which anecdotally and the data show never works. Uh, and also exurbia, because similar to the megachurches, the space is there and uh, it provides some recreational outlet of development and it actually functions as a, as a tax on small business locally on working in poor people, and it becomes symbolic of an economic decline that's happened more broadly across the United States, particularly in small towns, small suburbs, small exurbs, uh, and also just the lack of imagination from state and local leadership and national leadership to try to engender some sense of community and regain some economic stability uh, where it once existed, but now does not. Is there an irony there with casinos coming into these areas that are that 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 seem to be almost necessarily more uh, religious, at least in terms of identification and in terms of coding? Yeah, I, I suppose there's an irony, but I'm not sure if the the mega church adherents are the ones uh, rolling dice or placing bets. Uh, I'm not sure if, how much overlap there is between the, the, the MAGA, mega church faithful and the people gambling on the weekend. Uh, if you walk through these casinos in smaller areas, they tend to be elderly. Uh, they tend to appear working class, uh, though it's you know risky making superficial judgment, judgments. Uh, they don't tend to appear like the... Uh, better off tradesmen and small business owners who populate exurban towns and live in uh, subdivisions. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about what you said earlier about how many of the kind of local places of business are national chains versus suburbia tended to have some more small businesses, but and you know, places I'm picturing, it's like the Cabela's or the Walmart nearby is the, the, the fun place to go, or maybe even a, a, if you're up in this area, like a, a Cracker Barrel, but there's not many really any kind of communal spaces or locally owned um, uh, places to commune. Um, I'm, I'm being redundant, but you, you see what I'm saying, just how that what that speaks to about the the um, it's it's not there's uh, the lack of community, despite the fact that these places aren't urban areas uh, far from it. No, that's exactly it. You hit all the big ones, Cabela's, Walmart. Uh, Cracker Barrel, how could we forget, uh, Chick-fil-A, uh, and then just, you know, name your favorite or least favorite corporate train, chain, Applebee's, Chili's. Uh, exurban towns are often filled, too, with uh, 
Dollar General and Family Dollar, where families from the struggling suburbs can move in or not move, but shop in those areas. Uh, so the the local e economy is entirely dominated by corporate chains, and that contributes to this pervading sense of isolation in these areas. So without places to congregate and to develop some more organic sense of community and without local media, because these places are often news deserts, uh, they're living in isolation. They already have some politics of exclusion. Uh, they already have some politics of paranoia and prejudice, which drove them to exurbia in the first place. And now, because they're so isolated, they're not meeting people at the local bar or the local restaurant or the local music festival, and they don't have local media giving them a profile of a transgendered teenager or a Black Lives Matter activist. Uh, they're highly susceptible to this poisonous drug of fear and resentment and rage that Fox News and the right wing podcast sphere, you know, pumps into their veins every single day. Tucker Carlson becomes your local news anchor if you don't have a local news anchor. That's fascinating. And I would imagine, too, having only a series of corporate chains that the top level of executives are really sort of like the, you know, you've got your regional uh, manager may be, you know, located in the city 60, 70 miles away because they're handling a multiple uh, ones of these in the exurbs that they're traveling around, which means that you don't have people like even engaging in type of like a civic. Um, you don't have the same incentive structure for people to engage in civic life like you do in suburbia where, you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of people like I'm a local car dealer or or, or whatever it is. I'm going to go uh, or I'm the, you know, the uh, the the president of this local or the the owner of this small business. I'm going to go and uh, be a part of, uh, I don't know, the the, uh, the local goodwill uh, or uh, or whatever it is uh, committee because it's good for my business. But there's not that same instru incentive structure to build the community there because people aren't really invested in the community in any type of business sense either. Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, you know, my favorite bar is is owned by uh, uh, two friends of mine, husband and wife. And my my wife and I actually had our wedding reception there. And uh, they're on a local arts committee. They started a music festival in their town. It's good for their business, but they're also sincere people. They believe in these things. Uh, they're very charitable locally. But you make a great point. Uh, and it's to the extent that, for example, Texas Roadhouse, a popular corporate barbecue chain, actually has a script that they give all of their servers uh, of what to say, how to greet each customer, how to react to each customer's order. They even have planned times during the evening where they're all supposed to break out and dance to a certain country music song that's you know piping through. Uh, so it becomes impossible to develop any authentic sense of camaraderie with people that could exist and in fact thrives at the bar I was just referencing if everything is happening according to a corporate script. But the reason, one of the reasons for that, the existence of that script and the enforcement of it is exactly what you're saying. You don't have a local manager who can keep a close eye on all the employees. Everything has to be done according to the regional office, which goes back to the national office. And then culturally in Exerbia, you just have these dead zones. They're just wastelands. It, it's uh, amazing that I could ever conceive myself thinking like, boy, it sounds like they could use a mall. Uh, <laughs> But there, like all the malls are strip malls. I mean, there's, yes. there's no, there's, there's no sort of interior space uh, where people are even commingling. You don't even have, um, you, you're not even talking to the employee across the the way at the uh, local uh, Spencer Gift, uh, essentially, or the, uh, you know, Orange Julius. I know I mean, some of the <laughs> places are dated from my days in the mall, but, um, so. So we've got this situation where people are isolated and um, the, they're, 
their community to the extent that they have one tends to be around these sort of like uh, national right wing media uh, uh, of things and 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 the isolation. I mean, there seems to be this sort of like uh, unvirtuous, uh, I guess, feedback loop um, in that there is nothing to take them off of this course and they're spiraling. I, I wonder how much like how many people traveled uh, to January 6th with, you know, like how many local organizations there were there or if, whether it was like just two or three people who had gotten all their information from online. Mm. Well, they get the information online, but we have to also go back to the mega church. So many of these people, if they were members of a church, of course, some of them weren't, uh, but received blessings in advance. You know, let's, let's pray for you. Let's, let's hope that you succeed in uh, overturning an election. Uh, you know, I don't know. They're not Catholic, so they don't have like a patron saint of election subversion. Uh, but that's essentially what happens. So the, the feedback loop becomes quite destructive. And therefore, it's very difficult to break out of it. Uh, so if, if you're part of this right wing world and your teenage daughter says, I'm gay or I, or I think I'm transgendered, uh, you're, you're surrounded by a community that is going to have a very hostile reaction to that. So they may have to escape again, but you're certainly correct that it, that it is a feedback loop and it thrives on this isolation. So uh, Robert Putnam, who wrote the classic Bowling Alone about social capital or lack thereof, writes that where isolation lives, ex politics of extremism thrive. Uh, and again, that's because there's nothing to temper this increasingly paranoid, rabid, hateful view that you're developing uh, due to Fox News and right wing YouTubers. Uh, if you're living a life that as Jay Ferrer, the uh, songwriter and lead singer of Sunvolt sings in his song Exerbia is just work, car, road, home. That's it. So what are, I mean, I, I mean, this, to some extent, it, 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 they have the sort of classic, I guess, resentments that we see in the context of rural urban divide. Uh, but it's, it's of a different sort because it doesn't feel like there are policy prescriptions that could address their wants. Like, for instance, you know, I mean, uh, if you're if you're living in a rural area and, and we're talking about people who are on, let's say, city, not city, but m municipal or town infrastructure. Right. I mean, or, or are we talking people who have their own septic wells and their own uh, uh, you know, their own water and their own septic tanks? I mean, is it, it's a, a combination because I guess I'm like wondering, like, you know, in a rural area, there are things that can be done in terms of policy, in terms of like, you know, farmland and, and bringing in some type of infrastructure uh, by way of like uh, low cost cable and, uh, and development. These areas don't seem like they want as much or that they would feel as much business development that goes beyond other than the consumer culture that's there. And they're not relying on government for very much, it sounds like. Um, their level of poverty is not such that they're necessarily being touched by any type of government uh, programs outside of like, uh, their, their tax deduction on their mortgage. Um, what, how is this addressed? It, it's well, first of all, they, they, uh, they have very well developed infrastructure. In fact, because these are newly developed towns, it's actually better infrastructure than in many suburban towns. And that's why the property taxes are so low. So and that that creates its own right wing echo chamber in that mm -hmm. uh, they think that taxes are higher in, in more populated, diverse areas because of people, you know, exploiting welfare or or because of a proliferation of social services, when in reality, your property taxes are low because you've moved to an area with new pipes and you've moved to an area where they don't have to hire as many teachers and things of that nature. But to your point, politically, it's all dysfunctional and incoherent. 
So in the exurban towns near where I live, uh, this is where the school board meetings had become chaotic with unmask our kids. Politically, it's like they're chewing bubble gum. So you put a piece of bubble gum in your mouth and then after 20 minutes, the taste goes flat. There's no more flavor. You need another piece. So that's why we don't hear about things like critical race theory anymore. And it's kind of uh, right wing outrage du jour. Uh, it's all cultural. And, you know, Aristotle, who perhaps was the first political scientist, wrote that politics is about creating a community that could better serve human happiness. Uh, there is no policy prescription for exurban resentment because first of all, so much of it is racial. So much of it was white flight that drove them to exurbia. Uh, so you get these coded messages from the likes of Trump that reinforces that decision. You might remember in 2020, he even said that uh, Joe Biden was going to appoint <coughs> Cory Booker as a suburban czar. Uh, to make the suburbs more diverse and bring low income housing to suburbia. Uh, and then it's often Christian nationalism. So these two cultural outbursts, these tantrums of paranoia are driving so much of our political discourse and yet neither have anything really to do with public policy. It's disastrous. So what is the, I mean, I know you, you, you know, you, um, you, you write, uh, at the end, I guess it's at the end of the book. Um, you know, you, you, uh, you're, you're talking about the concept of hope and, uh, Jesse Jackson, one of the biggest, um, uh, uh, registrars of voters in the country. And, um, uh, you reference, um, your, your home, I guess it was your, your hometown of Val, uh, Prezio, uh, uh, Indiana, or, uh, one place that you, with, with a guy named Robert Cotton. Tell us about that. If, you know, to give us some measure of hope, or at least maybe indication of where this goes. No, that's hope is very important, and but it's it's not unrealistic because the thing to understand about so much of this is it's reactionary and reactive. Uh, the what's driving the exurbanites to those towns and what's driving their sense of paranoid and prejudicial politics is an adverse reaction to the stunning progress uh, of the civil rights movement, the LGBTQ rights movement, the feminist movement, uh, disability rights movement, uh, all of these movements that have helped to transform our country, certainly not make it perfect, but have made it move toward justice and toward equality, uh, the exurbanites don't like. So there's this nostalgia for an unrealized America that never really existed. Uh, Robert Cotton is one of the heroes of the book. I obtained my, I did my graduate studies at Valparaiso University. Uh, Valparaiso, Indiana, an exurb, uh, was a sundown town up until the late 1970s. And the Cotton family was the first- Explain uh, what sundown uh, Oh, of town. course. Uh, a sundown town is a place where if you were black, you understood you shouldn't be there after sundown because the police might arrest you on trumped up charges. You might get assaulted or in some cases murdered. Uh, and if your audience looks that up on the internet, there's a, there's a lot of documentation, including some great books on sundown towns. Uh, so the Cottons, a black family, moved to Valparaiso uh, in the early 1970s while it was still a sundown town. And they experienced a great degree of threats, hatred, harassment, you could imagine. They also had allies and supporters, otherwise they wouldn't have been able to move there and survive. Uh, well, now Robert Cotton, who was a little boy when his mother moved to Valparaiso, is on the city council. Uh, he's one of the heroes of the book. I also talked to people like the leaders of a local environmental mental group in the town where I live, who convinced a Republican town council to adopt a sustainability commission as part of the local government. So uh, you mentioned Jesse Jackson and his- Well, wait, let me let me just get back to Valparaiso for a second, because was that a function of, I mean, the, the, uh, the environmental stuff, I think like increasingly 
there's an awareness out there and if it's approached in a way that like um is somehow perceived as non uh, non-threatening or you know uh it may be in some quarters it has resonance but does cotton get elected in valparaiso because um he's he's just able to convince people and people have changed there or is it that the demographic nature of the town has changed a little bit of both so i uh he was able to appeal to people and there there was there was kind of a movement surrounding him to persuade people to get him on the city council uh but what makes valparaiso unique is the presence of valparaiso university uh which it's not a very large school but of course it, it attracts different types of people to that town it attracts faculty it attracts students uh it makes the profile of the town a little different than the average exurb. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I understand. I understood uh, in terms of that. I mean, so in terms of like, uh, God bless you, in terms of like recipes for how to deal with this, I mean, it, it, it feels largely, and I had a conversation with, um, which is not to say that everyone out there is necessarily authoritarian followers, but it seems like, you know, if you if you belong to a mega church, um, that's probably on the list. If you're going down the the list, and you know, I had a uh, correspondence with a guy named Bob Baltimore, who was one of the the foremost uh, sort of like uh, experts on on uh, uh, clinical authoritarians. Who who found he was from University of Manitoba. Said twenty five percent of North Americans are uh, right wing authoritarians. Um, and I had asked them about, uh, this cohort of people in the run up to the Trump election in 2016. He said, you know, basically he said like, there's no, there's no negotiating. You, you just got to beat them. Essentially. You have to beat them, uh, and hope that these inclinations go away or just become outnumbered essentially. Um, is that ultimately like what we're looking at here? Yeah, that, that's essentially it. Uh, I mean, if, if you want to have a heart-to-heart -heart with your uh, mega church, MAGA, you know, Steve Bannon subscribing uncle or cousin, you know, more power to you. Thank you for your service. Uh, but you, you mentioned Jesse Jackson. Uh, my previous book was about him. I spent a long time traveling with him and interviewing him. And one reason why he registered so many millions of people to vote is because he makes the point that if, if we vote, our numbers will win. If we don't vote, our numbers, we won't win because there are more of us than there are of them. And uh, I mean, how do you persuade these people? How do you persuade someone excited to vote for the guy who said to inject bleach during the, the pandemic uh, to have a more reasonable point of view. Instead, what's really necessary is on the ground participation all the way down to the local level. You know, there's a reason that Steve Bannon and others are telling their followers to get involved with the school board, get involved with the local library, get involved with the county election commission. Uh, this is a right wing strategy that dates back a long time. And I documented in the book some of the major players. Uh, so now anyone left of center, whether you consider yourself a, a mainstream Democrat or a Democratic Socialist or something in between, needs to bring that same aggression and concentration to their hometown, to their county, to their school board and so on and so forth. It's interesting the way um, uh, 2016 was set up in many respects was, um, you know, I think it was in 2014 or 2012 when Acorn was taken out, which was uh, probably the single uh, greatest national, um, in addition to providing other services and uh, support for uh, low income folks, but also one of the, the biggest um, registers of, of voters across the country was... Um, was uh you know attacked and then uh, basically abandoned by the democrats in the lead up to to you know uh like maybe it was the second term of uh of of obama um and there's that advantage that's built in right if you're concentrated in more densely populated areas organizing is in many respects easier and that's the advantage that sits on the table uh for 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 defeating these folks 
Um, yes, great point. Uh, uh, really appreciate that, David. Uh, uh, I'm going to say it uh, <laughs> right. Uh, Ma Matt Siotra, um, author, lecturer, journalist based in Indiana. The book is Exerbia Now, the Battleground of American Democracy. We've got a link for that at majority.fm and in the podcast and YouTube descriptions. Uh, really interesting stuff. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Sam, Emma, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much, David. All right, folks, we're going to take a uh, quick um, break and head into the fun half. I, I was uh, incredible how on point his descriptions were of that. And I couldn't have articulated it, it like that. But, you know, I was thinking of places like that I would visit. You know, I was very close with my cousin. She grew up in central Pennsylvania. Uh, exactly like this or places that i visited for trump rallies like uh ohio or uh, places in ohio or johnson city tennessee like, those are some of just the things that came to mind as exactly the the kind of place he was describing just even like if, if you look at the last like 20 ims we've had <laughs> i just saw this as they were popping up as we were talking yeah um here it is let's see juniper j uh uh okay Okay, well, uh, someone taking issue with Texas Roadhouse being a barbecue restaurant. It's not a barbecue restaurant, okay. he says. Uh, Hank Aaron uh, says, uh, the profile fits uh, my neighbor's parents to a T. They live in suburb, miles from the Atlanta perimeter. Atlanta actually plays a big part in his book, or the uh, Atlanta excerpts. As mm. Atlanta suburbs experience growth, especially black and Hispanic populations, they decided to move to the North Georgia mountains because they were scared of crime. Despite moving to a small town with violent crime right 50 to 100% higher than the suburbs. I'm from Northeast Indiana, says Bantram Parkinson. Uh, I can confirm everything in this interview. Apocalypse prepping is also massive in these areas. We're the one buying the, uh, the sloppy rice buckets. Um, Bingo Dango, guys describing some people I know out on Long Island to a T, utterly resentful of everything about the city and suburbs other than uh, the tons of money they make as a result of the economic engine they claim to not be relying on. I don't know if, I mean, I agree that it's, it's it makes sense, like their attitudes are similar, but they're still in suburbia in Long Island. I mean, that's, that. It, this is more, I think... Uh, uh, this You have to be further out from the city, I think, to, I to think talk there's, about that. I think there's some places that are like super out east yeah that are maybe a little bit less densely populated um central pa uh, this person's this is literally northwest georgia says it, yep, aaron yep. from atlanta yes in fact it, that's mentioned uh in the book um folks just a reminder it is your support that makes this show pop uh, possible and popular frankly yeah, I mean, listen, we're if very you can't, popular. we're very popular, we're very cool. Um, but if you um, if you can't afford to uh, support the show by becoming a sustaining member at join the majority report dot com. Uh, and when you do that, you make this show possible. The other thing you can do is pass around our videos. Give us a, a like on iTunes. I mean, people don't I don't know how many people listen to podcasts anymore on iTunes. Well, iTunes isn't even a thing anymore, Sam. So. You know what I'm saying? Give us a like on anywhere. Apple Podcasts or on oh, Spotify. God, it's so cumbersome to rate say us that. five stars on any of those podcast platforms. Like the stream, so it gets to the top of the algorithm. Anything you do can contribute. Yeah, if you're in uh, our uh, like our Twitch chat or our YouTube chat, go uh, to other places and drop links in and uh, push our videos. That really does help us a lot. Uh, so anything you can do to uh, spread the word of the show is uh, very much appreciated um folks i don't know if we have any more um majority report 20th anniversary mugs left they were the fastest selling uh piece of merch we've ever had i mean wow they're sleek with the that black look this this is really cool then the t-shirts and the hats are also uh getting uh, going crazy that I, I gotta say that gray shirt that may be my favorite shirt that we have well, we, I don't know why. You should get a gray one. We have black ones here. But, I know. Yeah. I want the I want the gray. Um, and I will say, and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but Julie was like, y is that really the logo you want to do for the 20th, uh, 20th anniversary? And I'm like, exactly. She goes, it, right. it, it looks, looks like cheesy. a golf tournament. Yeah. And I said, yeah, that's my... The point. That's my point. That's the look I go for. We're happy Gilmoreing it here. Yeah, here which, we go. Yeah. Twenty years of pausing it, ladies and gentlemen, and and in many ways that's a lie. 
Um, I got to go back and see if I ever said pause it when it was just uh, audio. But probably. How, what would I have said? Hmm? Stop it? Yeah, no, right. Temporarily stop it. Yeah. It's got to be 20 years of that. Maybe I can't, I can't imagine. Like when I was on the radio, obviously we didn't have video. Um, when it first started, 2004, it was, YouTube didn't even, wasn't even right. right. I can't imagine I said temporarily stop that audio. I can't imagine that either, but this is, good, this is a good, this is a good case. We could use AI for this to go through the 2004 original majority report episodes and find the first time <gasps> the words pause it were uttered. Yep. Right. Yep. We could do that. Actually, somebody just actually, and I lost the IM, but somebody uh, in the IMs and maybe we'll come across it said that they had uh, some archived materials that they wanted to uh, send, I think. And if that's the case, send us an email at majority reporters at gmail.com. Obviously we have all the archives of this show, uh, of this iteration of the show, but it's the early air America stuff, because of course those uh, brainiacs there, um, it didn't occur to them to dump off the material on these servers when they were going to sell the servers for $400 or whatever yeah, it everything is. Everything I learn about them over there just makes me just wonder if there was some sort of gas leak. Just or, uh, yeah. uh, unbelievable. Um, also, folks, amquickie.com. Sign up for the AM Quickie. It's great. It really is great. I mean, honestly, it's my cheat sheet for when I host. I check, check that over just to see if I missed anything. Well, you're not really cheating. Well, I know. But, I mean, I am having uh, Jacob and Corey do a little, like a fraction of my work for me. You're just, they're aggregating. I yes. mean, it's that's all part of the machine here. It's not, that's not cheating. Totally. Um, Emma, speaking of... Uh, well, I guess there was no cheating in the that game last night. There, well, I mean, there, there. A lot of people have some questions about some of the calls that Iowa was getting, um, but they did end up losing. I, I think that there's actually a really interesting conversation to be had, which we will have today on ESPN about Caitlin Clark, um, how her whiteness does elevate her to this extremely ele, you know, elevated public. Pro, persona where she's being highlighted to such a degree but at the same time she didn't ask she didn't ask for this and she's really great um so i think it's a complicated conversation about you know racism and white privilege but also what it, we should be acknowledging her ex incredible talent and impact on women's sports in general as well uh youtube.com slash espn show today we'll talk about that and of course south carolina's incredible performance in the final another undefeated season we got a um, clip of her coach too afterwards oh right? yeah that was awesome. she's incredible um and and, and <sighs> i mean they didn't lose one game this season so that's how south carolina ended up winning the championship and the women's game just being i think so much higher higher quality this year than the, the the men's game um in in that tournament we'll also talk a little bit about Do how doc rivers is being doc rivers and the milwaukee bucks i have very deep concerns about them um and the stefan Diggs digs trade to houston uh, youtube.com slash espn show today i don't know how you don't talk about the celtics every day well i mean it's boring they're extremely good and they're going to win the east so i don't know what to tell you like there's really nobody that's going to challenge them i think um aggressively i find it exciting well, the, it's really the most basketball I've watched probably in, yeah, like I don't know, forty years. I mean, they are. Uh, I don't know what if this is up there with them for like one of their winningest seasons, but it's got to be right. It's got to be up there, but it, it's such a different uh, NBA now that you totally. can't really compare. It's I mean, they beat the Kings though with their start with most of their starters not even playing. Uh, I, I watched a little of that game. No, but... they they've got they they've got like a. They've almost got eight starters. Yeah. Well, maybe ten, maybe nine. Look, I, I hear you. The the I don't talk about it that much because I don't want to jinx anything. But the New York Rangers just tied their uh, all time win total for a season you yesterday. You just jinxed it. <sighs> you just jinxed You're it. Not, you don't even want to tell people what I asked you. Uh, uh, I said Wait, hypothetically, if something were to happen. Oh my God, that was one of the most could I have ridiculous things off? I've ever heard. We should talk about this in the fun half. It's so disturbing. It was really disturbing to like be sitting here watching you do this. that. Yeah, <laughs> this is what she said. She said she just like absolutely hypothetically, if a certain team locally was to win a into no, a I wouldn't have said the W word. No, no, no. Uh, was to advance 
in like the um uh, the a uh, thing where different teams play each other's after the regular season. Um, would it be possible for me to get that day off if that team were to prevail and there being a parade? And I'm like, what are you talking about? The W word. <laughs> she doesn't want it. She doesn't want to jinx the Rangers from winning by actually like even articulating the possibility they could win. This is crazy ass magical thinking. I know. That is like beyond. It's, it's truly, I haven't even. Yeah, but Here's the weirdest part. Yeah. What? It worked for me in no, the 20. The it next, worked for me in the 2011, 2012 no, uh, no, Giants no. season. The I didn't next use day, the W word. Yeah. I got a call yeah. from the general manager of the Rangers. Oh, Jesus. And it had showed up on like their. Uh, their plotter that someone had. Folks, we'll see you in the fun half. Jesus. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Fun hat. Matt! Who? Fun hat. What is up, everyone? Fun hat. Nomi Key. Uh, you did it! Fun hat. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun hat. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint you. everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's... Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But dude, uh, you want to smoke this... Uh, 7 a. Yes. Hi, me? This me? Yes. Uh, is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello, is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? Oh, no sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. Oh, I'm going to go start Who libertarians? They're so stupid though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking did! So, what's 79 plus 21? Challenge man. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857 210 35 501 1 half. 38. 911, for instance. $3,400. $1,900. $6,543 trillion sold. It's a zero sum game. Actually, you're making me think less of it. But, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> You can call it satire. Sam goes, it's satire. On top of it all, yeah. my favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, yeah. like everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> all right, folks, folks, folks. It's just the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I, I don't know. But you should know. The, People the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Um, Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Uh, uh, the, the, Look, um, gotta jump. I gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. Uh, um, Two o'clock. We're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you, bye. Love you. Bye-bye. We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Viglin on the Majority Report. Gerald from New Orleans, say what you want about Twitter, but where else can I call perjury Taylor Green a dumb mother effer who understands science as well as dark ages peasants for suggesting that eclipses are caused by sinning? Is that the case? We should do, maybe get a clip of that if that's what she's saying. Well, we'll definitely have we'll some dumb uh, tweet on that. Republicans never miss an opportunity to make some sort of like natural event into either an act of God or uh, an act of... I don't know, gay people ruining society or something like that, or DEI. 
uh, the Huntsman. I think we need to be careful about classifying everyone in the newly termed Exerbia as participants in white flight. People I know in rural Alabama have always been here. Many of them have terrible politics, but they aren't a monolith. My grandpa was a farmer and a radical. We never left. I can't ask him, but I suspect he was involved in the Alabama uh, Communist Party. Anyway, read Hammer and Ho and stop pretending you can only be a radical in a city, LOL. Uh, not only have I read Hammer and Ho, uh, but what's his name? Um, Robin uh, D.G. Kelly. Yeah, we Robin had uh, Kelly on about that book um, when you were still in your diapers. Yeah, I don't well, think I we're don't know pretending when, I don't, that. I don't know when, uh, I don't know how old you are. Also, I don't husband. think that But we, we, we interviewed yeah. uh, Kelly, I guess maybe it was five or six years ago now. I think, but we had him on even more recently for, I think, the 20th anniversary or 30-year anniversary of Hammer and Ho. I'll double check the time. But we had him on in my, during one time in my tenure. I feel well. like we had him on for uh, Juneteenth. Oh, maybe that's it. Yeah. Also, I just think the premise is wrong. Like that, you know, the, it, it's not just rural communities. I, the, it, I think he was clear in that it's kind of a halfway point in between suburbia and rural communities and what he's describing. Yes, right? but I imagine there's parts of rural areas that have been eaten up Affected. by, yeah. by it, that have been converted into essentially exurbia. I mean, that's the way it rolls, right? And um, there being some, you know, old timers there. Um, Sam's Cedar Selected Seeds and Ciders. Hmm. I don't know if I'm going to read things that are meant to trip me up. Being a relatively left-leaning person out here, I got to tell you, the left is utterly suppressed, and there's a rabid contingent of just the guys that he was talking about. Yes, I would imagine. Um, Silk City Cedarar. Uh, the Celtics, one of the top net rating teams ever at plus 12. I think only 96, 98 bills had uh, higher or near. Yeah, they are incredibly well built. Um, and... Yeah, I think they have the ability to win it all this year. Just depends on if Denver is gonna gonna be the one that uh, I don't know challenges them or wins in the finals. I think I think if, I I would predict Denver uh, Boston right now if I had to, but that's not a hot take. Future reactionary casual Monday for the eclipse. Uh, Caleb from Iowa. This show is falling apart. I think the key point in describing these exurban spaces is the lack of an industrial era skeleton i.e. a town that has never experienced an economic decline since its inception. Lots of suburban communities might have had unionized factories or plants that provide a framework for political organizing, but these exurban communities do not and never did. Yes, I mean, I think that's what he was saying, is that there is no, there is no infrastructure there. Right. It's all brand new. And it's all um, put there, essentially, to service a car community. Um, and... I think, uh, you know, part of it is also there's no, like, sort of, like, real work going on there. Um, it seems like people are going in, doing most of their work, you know, uh, further into the uh, into the suburbs. Uh, Biddy, for your thoughts. Bullprog, thanks for a reminder that it's Monday. Thank you. Uh, Chris D. Sam, finally standing up to intro John Benjamin, 20 years overdue. Just remember to point it out and receive presidential immunity, Bradley. Kowalski, uh, nice to start off the show with H. John Benjamin being wrong. Does he not know when it's Monday? Let's not forget back in 2017, the brave Donald Trump stared into that sun for 10 seconds. Fox News said it made him a strong leader. Donald Trump claims to be on the side of creating healthy families, yet his presence destroys everyone's sexual desires. <laughs> uh, I'm glad I sent those cupcakes to snap you out of your fasting psychosis. Zero summer, casual Monday. Zirner, I sent you an email about having an archive of the Air American broadcast. Let me know if you're interested. I could mail you a thumb drive to you. Oh, that would be great. Wow. 80 gigs of shows. Whoa. Amazing. Amazing. The, uh, who, what's your email? Zirner. I'll, 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 oh, okay. I'll find it at majorityreporters at gmail.com. We don't want to have them say what their email is. Oh, sorry. Uh, El Knipson. Um, are you arguing for rationalizing the eclipse? That's pretty far left of you. Oh, nationalizing the eclipse. I already know what's getting amended into the Majority Report company policy comp, uh, book, Country Music Dancing. Uh, who's the ninth starter, Sam? Is it Peyton Pritchard or Sam Hauser? Which is it, Sam? I mean, pick them. 
I have to, I, I just remember when I see Hauser, I'm like, I remember when Chris Ford, they'd bring him out onto the court to shoot like, if he could shoot three threes in a game, it was like, whoa, this right. guy's a, a gunslinger. This is crazy. I mean, the game is, uh, well, we, I'll get into it on the SVM, but just the, like the level of technical skill, that's why scoring is up and, and things like that. Um, and that's the same thing why people like Caitlin Clark, right? It's the Steph Curryification of the NBA. And um, all these guys are just, they're training and from young age and women to become incredible shooters behind the arc. It's crazy. Yep. Hauser shoots those like yeah. People just shot like jumpers. I know, like like you know, like uh, ten foot jumpers. Yeah, when, I mean, and I was watching. That's why when people are like, I remember back in my day, I wanted them to just like be playing physically in the paint. It's like, well, games evolve and people become better, and <laughs> there's sports science, and that's kind of just how things go. So, I would if if I saw someone like Porzinga shooting a three point oh, uh, shot. Like I the Robert Parrish shooting a three point shot. Like I don't think he shot anything that wasn't two feet you away. You would have thought basket. he was an alien. No, I would have just been like, What are you doing? Yeah, right. Like like right. that's how your game. Like <laughs> what are you yeah. doing? Shoot. Yeah. Like, why would you do that? Who's gonna get the rebound? Right. Like right. what like what are you doing? Yeah. All right. I'm gonna calm down. Um so we were talking Friday about a potential change in U.S. policy, uh, and or at the very least, a a real change in the vibes that's coming on. And 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 over the course of the weekend, we have seen uh, a lot of indication of that. Nancy Pelosi, and this is obviously in the wake of the uh, killing of the World Central Kitchen uh, workers. Let me just start by saying how grotesque it is that it takes um, seven Western aid workers. Well, six and plus the Palestinian and driver. the Palestinian driver. Yeah. Um, but let's be honest. It's the six right. uh, Western aid workers to be killed for people in Washington, D.C. to realize that there's something uh horrible going on there like it is i don't know if that means that like um you know each western aid worker is worth five to six thousand dead palestinians that we know of because um uh, like emma's been saying for a long time there's now more and more uh reporting to the effect of like there's thousands upon thousands who are missing of course and have presumed been, and, and presumed dead of course they're dead um, because you know, where, where there's no place to hide, uh, in, uh, in Gaza. Um, and, uh, but with that said, what has changed over the course of the weekend has been a, you see media reporting things like this, like NBC just had a story on, uh, the universities that were all blown up by the Israelis three months ago. And it's literally months and months ago that the last one was blown up. And you just see, too, how Democrats, when they change their rhetoric, the coverage goes with it, too. Like, that's how Republicans have been so adept at at, at pressuring the media throughout my lifetime. Like, now that some Democrats have woken up, and it's not just white aid workers, too, and people who were feeding people, just the most benevolent human beings risking their lives knowing that they would feed people. And there have been many Palestinian aid workers killed as well. Oh, yeah. I but, mean, but but it's the fact that these guys worked with, these workers worked with this celebrity chef. Exactly. This celebrity chef who's personal friends with Nancy Pelosi, apparently, who um, she, in January, signed a letter um, along with some other, I think, McGovern and other Democrats recommending Jose Andres for the Nobel, Pe Nobel Peace Prize for his work in Ukraine. So they have a close relationship. And she was one of 40 Democrats, the squad, but like Mark Pocan, Barbara Lee in the House. Jim McGovern. Jim McGovern, um, who in the wake of this, because of the, the personal relationship with, I mean, and it's infuriating, as you say, but it's still good progress. I'll take what I can get. They signed a letter not saying conditioning aid to Israel, but that Biden should pause military aid altogether right now. And I want to I want to note too, uh, McGovern was. We just played that clip uh, not a week ago of of protesters in Worcester 
showing up right. at a fundraiser that Hakeem Jeffries were there. And, uh, you know, I haven't been involved in Worcester politics for, you know, for a long time. Uh, but I, I can't imagine there's too many places that Jim McGovern goes in Worcester where he gets protested about a foreign policy. I can, I can assure you of that. Um, so with all that said, We've got uh, this letter coming out there with Pelosi signing it, um, and uh, I I did not see uh, her uh, video or written apology to uh, Rashida Tlaib, but uh, we'll let that go for the moment. Or the Uh, uh, her coming forward with all her uh, CCP money that must be influencing her to say that as she accused protesters early on of being working for China. Uh, I I don't I don't want to get sidetracked. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm saying I don't want to get sidetracked too. Like we're both can fall into that hole of like what is different now between then and january like i mean an extra ten thousand people no we know what the difference is is that uh you know celebrity chefs uh, uh aid workers were killed uh, uh horribly of course i don't mean to diminish that but um and on top of which we saw the biden administration both kirby and obviously biden had some phone call with uh, netanyahu saying you know we're serious this time I don't know how serious he he was or not, but, you know, Pelosi signing that document, uh, you know, says that the allows him at least to say, like, even even the people who are your biggest, your staunchest allies who are willing to say the most ridiculous things two months ago are now uh, finding a problem with this. Then yesterday, 330 trucks make it through from Israel into Gaza with aid uh, that came from an Israeli port. That is the most since October 7th. Now, it's nowhere near what they need. It used to be 500 trucks a day uh, prior to October 7th. But what that shows me is, is that Joe Biden, it turns out, does have some ability to change uh, what Israel does. And if he has the ability to uh, say there's got to be a change and there's, I want aid in there, maybe he also has the ability to say, like... Um, which he also said to uh, uh, Netanyahu, um, how about actually not sending fake negotiators to the negotiations, but ones that will actually be able to get the hostages returned? I mean, so uh, there is a change. Here is Bernie Sanders on uh, Pod Save America. We just saw, obviously, Tim Kaine, too, was, I think, on the Sunday talk shows uh, talking about this. Kaine, you'll recall, was one of the few senators to boycott when Netanyahu came uh, to speak in front of a uh, joint session of Congress when he was invited yeah. by John Boehner during the uh, Obama years. Um, and so uh, the, 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 the senators are coming out and they're making themselves known publicly, the ones who have been saying this stuff in private. But here's Bernie Sanders on Pod Save America and also addressing both like the issue of, uh, of, of Biden pretending to be mad at Netanyahu and also like, you know, what you young people are going to do in terms of voting because they're the ones who really care about this issue. So the White House says that um, uh, in a call today, President Biden told Netanyahu that, quote, the strikes on aid workers in the humanitarian situation are unacceptable. He underscored that an immediate ceasefire is essential and said that, quote, U.S. policy with respect to Gaza will be determined by our assessment of Israel's immediate action to address civilian harm, humanitarian suffering, and the safety of aid workers. Do you, how do you take that statement? Do you take that to mean that he might be finally ready to budge on conditioning well, aid? See, or? As you know, there have been a lot of statements. Yes. I mean, one day I'm angry. You know, the president is angry at Netanyahu. The next day he's very angry. Right. And the next day he's very, very angry. You know, so what? At the same time, uh, there is support uh, for more military aid. We're talking about $10 billion uh, in a supplemental bill that I voted against uh, for that reason. I'm not going to give Netanyahu another $10 billion uh, in military aid to continue to kill women and children I- in Gaza. Um, now, I hope, I mean, the president is not stupid, and I know the president. And he is, in his heart, a very decent human being. I know he's hurting from what's going on. Now, why they have continued this policy? If you ask me that question, I cannot give you an answer. I have some speculation. I have some guesses. But I wouldn't even say it publicly. I don't know why. But I would hope that the president understands that from a moral perspective and from a political perspective, because that young Palestinian 
in Michigan is not the only person. The polls are very clear. A majority of the American people, I think the last poll I saw was like 52%, think the United States should stop military aid to Israel. Uh, and among Democrats and among young people, the numbers are much higher. So the president is now engaged in a very, very difficult campaign. So from a moral perspective and from a political perspective, I hope very much that what he's saying today really does indicate a change of policy. But we will know. You cannot continue to talk about your worries about humanitarian situation in Gaza and then give Netanyahu another $10 billion or more bombs. You cannot do that. That is hypocritical. What, in your view, would it look like for the president to match his words with actions? And do you think that the president himself would be able to stop, uh, you know, congressional funding of uh, yes. further aid to Israel? I think the answer is pretty simple. Uh, Mr. Netanyahu, I'm here to inform you that if the border is not open tomorrow, we have thousands of trucks that are not get in to start feeding starving people. All military aid will cease. Have a nice day. I mean, I, I really I, I appreciate that aggressive, uh, more aggressive posture towards Biden here, because we know that Bernie Sanders feels like Biden is someone he's been able to work with during his time in the Senate. They have a friendlier relationship than um, I, that I think has maybe contributed to Bernie Sanders holding back some criticism. But being clear there that it's the rhetoric is not ma matching uh, the actions is really important. So. Bernie is, you know, it sh should have been him. We all know this. But this, when listening to that, it reminded me I had meant to highlight this to you, Sam. Did you see this Jonathan Geyer piece in the American Prospect? I just sent it. Bradley, if we could pull this up, because this was amazingly insightful into into Biden's uh, Biden's mentality. Um, and it and it also dovetailed very nicely with some of the things I learned in my interview with Anel Sheline uh, when she resigned from the State Department. This part here. The reason for Joe Biden's particular brand of Israel policy is Joe Biden. People who worked with him throughout his 45-year career as senator and then vice president say that on this issue, he is Zionist and pro-Israel, and he means it. He's been close with every Israeli prime minister since Golda Meir, as he rem reminds audiences, and his go-to one-liner is, if Israel didn't exist, we would have to invent it. For Biden, Israel is not just a foreign policy issue, as Haim Saban, the Israeli-American businessman, who's raising millions for the re-election campaign, puts it, Biden is pro-Israel in his gut. It's in his kishkas. Um, I think that's how you say it. I have no idea. Well. Okay. No? Yeah. Yes? Yes. Uh, um, I mean, it's, it's good enough. Okay. Uh, Biden at times has been forward-thinking on domestic policy and flexible in updating his old think school thinking when it comes to anti-monopoly policy or reproductive, eager to listen to workers on the issues they care about. On foreign policy, he has often strayed from the Washington establishment, withdrawing from Afghanistan and avoiding knee-jerk hawkishness on China. Not so on Israel and Palestine. And that willingness to buck the establishment has given him confidence in the face of outside criticism and an allergy to changing course. So that is really important because we've noted that the difference between what Lloyd Austin is saying and what the administration is saying has been different and divergent from the beginning, where there's much more of an anxiety from like the pentagon and from people who are in the in the blob whatever you want to call it the foreign policy establishment because they worry about what uh, unbridled support for israel does to our regional standing and our objectives in the, in in the region but there's a massive political zionist force within uh the u.s government also apac and all of their influence that contributes to it to it but one more portion that i wanted to highlight because it, it this was the part that uh anel said uh, or indicated and this is i think proof of it um biden was the first democratic president you got to scroll down a bit um in a generation to not show a serious effort toward a palestinian state the idea was to keep the middle east a perennial career killer off the president's desk that led to a diplomatic void and the further disenfranchisement of Palestinians, which likely contributed to the current war. There were a handful of minor economic summits between the Israel, the U.S., and Arab states where settler violence surged in the West Bank. Even before the October attacks, Israeli human rights watchdog uh, Yesh Din called in 2023 the most violent year in settler violence against Palestinians in the West Bank in both the number of incidents and their severity, which highlights just how late the Biden administration has been in sanctioning of Israeli settlers. And then this part here. Running point from the White House is Brett McGurk. 
the National Security uh, Council's coordinator for the Middle East and North Africa, who worked on Iraq and the Bush, Obama, and Trump administrations, McGurk said early on that uh, Biden was pursuing a back-to-basics approach to the Middle East, but it's unclear where the U.S. would be going back to. Basically, so this is what she said to me, was that her assessment is that Brett McGurk is the one who is... Uh, driving who is driving this? yeah he's horrible and uh, you remember that early plan he had uh, laid out i'm also be curious as to what uh, mcgurk's uh, attitude is towards iran because um it was one of the big mysteries that we had covered and i don't want to be you know uh, i don't want to overstate this but one of the the things that we had been very unclear on is why biden didn't just go in and re-up the uh iranian nuke deal that we thought he was going to do and it didn't seem like it would have been too difficult to do frankly certainly not politically i mean they passed the american rescue act and the republicans were talking about dr seuss for six weeks they you know like honestly like he could have done that easily at that time right and it becomes clear if you have this guy mcgurk in there and i would imagine uh, he is a big hawk on Iran. I haven't seen any reporting to this, but this is all my guess. This is all my speculation. But the idea, I mean, this is what is really uh, completely nuts, because you talked about Lloyd Austin, you know, basically saying, and I think a lot of it was also just military doctrine, like this country's history has been sort of like marred for 50, 60 years uh, at this point now with our experience in Vietnam and understanding the counterinsurgency, like, you know, like what Israel's trying to do in regards to Hamas, uh, at this point is impossible. And, uh, and they know this and, and certainly, uh, uh, Lloyd Austin knows it. He said, you can win a battle, but you will lose the war, um, regardless. But when you see stuff like in the middle of this, Israel is striking an Iranian consulate in Syria. You got to ask yourself, even if you're the biggest Israeli supporter in the world, why in the world would they they be doing that? Mm -hmm. Why in the world, when you are increasingly being made a pariah in uh, in the world, would you provoke a response from Iran? By doing something that was a blatant disregard of international law. And, and of course, they're all sitting there, you know, Israel now is like they're all they're all terrified. And part of it was to probably generate that domestic fear so that if there is any type of and we're starting to see some some protests against the actual continuous of the assault on Gaza in Israel. It's, a, you know, by no means like a, you know, mass but, but we're seeing some. But the the idea that we now have Iran basically on a daily basis, it sounds like, contacting the Americans going like, we're not going to attack. We're not going to attack. We don't want to get drawn into this either. Israel is, is, is They're explicitly trying to spark a regional, yes. spark a regional yes. war. Yes. Uh and, and uh, drawing us in. And and uh, that's if that's Iran involved. attacks Israel, that's it. I mean, how is Biden? They, the Netanyahu knows how Biden's going to respond in, in in that in that instance. So I mean, I just found I, I couldn't recommend this guy or piece in the American Prospect more highly because it's just so comprehensive and it goes to. Sh- and he also later on, you know, does talk about um, how there is uh, this this national the deputy national security advisor john finer has been a bit of a moderating force or attempting to make some sort of gains in that way um but mcgurk has lasted multiple administrations trump bush and obama and this kind of like i mean his thinking on this clearly is not helping matters but also the fact that you know you see how biden is operating from a gut level i remember hearing that about george w bush oh. when he used to talk about how he feels like you know i, he, I look i looked in pooty poot's eyes and i, and I, I deal with it in my gut man. like this is not this is not a way to, <laughs> to clearly to uh put forward a foreign policy that is going to be um coherent in any way but that his gut feel was afghanistan withdrawing from there 
And now his gut feel in this way is just to support Israel through and through. That seems to be changing at least slightly, but it does explain how basically he's petulant in this way. And I don't believe that it's uh, necessarily gotten better with age, his, his um, tendency to operate from the gut. Yeah, hard to know if it's, um, you know, I don't know if it just petulance or just, you know, I think he just also doesn't seem to um, uh, consider Palestinians to be actually um, yeah. human beings. All right. But if there's any message uh, for today, there's two of them. One is uh, let's put up this graphic of the uh, of the reporting about the 330 um, uh, first. Th that'll come second. But first, I want the 330 um aid trucks going in 332 aid trucks entered uh 22 322 aid trucks entered uh gaza yesterday um that tweet is from sunday uh that for all the people who have said you could take that down now for all the people who have said that joe biden didn't have the ability to influence israel I give you that. And, um, and, and also, let's be clear. Again, he's doing this because uh, the guy who had the first Michelin restaurant in Washington, D.C. Um, had his aid workers killed uh, by Israel. And then the other message of the day is this. The U.N. says Israel, this is from the Times of Israel. Um, from just, uh, just the, uh, the, on the sixth. So this was just on, uh, Saturday, the day after, um, the UN says Israel approved reopening of 20 bakeries, water pipeline in Northern Gaza. If you are one of those people who still somehow managed to believe that, Gaza had any type of uh, autonomy that the Palestinians there, they had 20 years to build their paradise there. Um, because, you know, it was actually 18 years ago that the Israelis pulled out uh, and they had it all. You try and build your paradise when some other country has the ability to say, we're not going to allow you to open a bakery or you're not going to have water. They do the same thing with electricity. And frankly, they do the same thing with calories, literally calories. Yep. So those two lies, um, I hope, are, are done. We're done sort of pretending uh, that stuff. Um, and hopefully we'll see more stories from the mainstream media about the total destruction of the universities in Gaza the total destruction of the hospital facilities. Um, I mean, on and on. It, it, it's just absurd at this point. And uh, there was one... I wanted to pull this out, too. Oh, the other thing in terms of, like, ethnic cleansing, right? I mean, if you don't want to call it a genocide, uh, you know, have fun with that. But there's stories in, uh, in, the, in the Wall Street Journal because we keep hearing over and over again about Hamas won't, uh, Hamas won't, uh, you know, negotiate. Um, Israel is basically saying they're only going to allow 60,000 residents uh, to return to northern Gaza, the north part of Gaza. I mean, uh that's definitionally ethnic cleansing. And what is there to return to? I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing. What do they have in Rafa? Like, you know, I mean, the bottom line is, you know, you're in a tent city in Rafa. If you're in a tent city, at least in the north, you've, uh, you know, and AIDS coming in, you, it's just easier to uh, service uh, people when they are not as densely packed in that way, in terms of water, in terms of bread. In terms of like, you know, 20 bakeries that are allowed to open in the north or whatever it is. I mean, the whole thing is just the amount of just crap that is served up to justify what Israel has been doing has been just insane. But yep. we should move on because we've we've.
We have, but one more piece of information. Um, <laughs> CNN's reporting that an Israeli doctor who's working on some of the patients that came out of Gaza is reporting that handcuffs are uh, have been dug so deeply into the uh, the prisoners' arms that amputations of their hands is becoming routine. These are camps um, that are they're being thrown into, and with really no little little explanation, bound for days, blindfolded, defecating in diapers, um, and and being basically kept without food except what comes through a straw. So um, these are like extremely obvious images of genocide. But the Western press is beginning, beginning to absorb it, I guess. And, I mean, hopefully more actions follow. Uh, the, the fact that Biden is now having, like, these products made in the occupied West Bank being labeled as such is, is kind of incredible, given the fact that in the majority of states in this country, boycotting, divesting, and sanctioning Israel is right. literally like, illegal. What are we supposed to do with that information? But, um, one is uh, one issue voter. Sam, I want to be a one-issue voter to stop the funding of Israel and stop the genocide and push for a permanent ceasefire. Um, well, A, you can't be. <laughs> There's no such thing. There's no such thing. Um, in addition to being a one-issue voter, I think, uh, being a mistake, largely, but, you, you know, you do you. Um, there is no one you can vote. I mean, Emma just said... Um, Biden is now uh, insisting that uh, products made in the West Bank uh, have that label when they come in. That is reversing a Trump decision in 2020 uh, uh, before he was out of office uh, to have everything uh, out of the West Bank uh, called from Israel. The Abram Accords, the movement uh, of Jerusalem, the, the idea that, uh, that Trump would have done anything different, I think is just fantastical. Uh, but... You know, if you think that Donald Trump is going to come in and in the event that he's going to be the one to put the brakes on Israel, I think you're you're nuts. I think Donald um, Trump might say end the war and the end the slaughter. But once that's done, you know, who's going to be coming in? His son in law, Jared Kushner, to develop the Gaza Strip into the luxury developments that they've been coveting. He brags to this day about how he gave them the Golan Heights, which is worth trillions of dollars, whether that be real estate or frickin, you know, oil reserves under the ground whatever the case may be he he may care about the optics of the genocide but he definitely doesn't care about he actually definitely covets the idea of ethnically cleansing the land for profit i would also say um he says uh, uh i am unable to see how biden is the lesser of two evils can you help me understand how trump will be worse if he said and we know that he cares about public perception and image amongst uh, world leaders who are increasingly turning uh, his backs to Israel. Well, first off, um, if you're going to be a one-issue voter, and um, you're really not making a, a lesser of two evils assessment. You're just being a one-issue voter. Um, and in that respect, if uh, there is no ceasefire by the time that uh, you, uh, you're faced with your, your opportunity to vote, I mean, voting for Trump, if you believe Donald Trump is going to do something different and is going to come in and, and force Israel to end the war uh, in November, whatever it is, 10th, then that's a, not an illogical vote. Um, more than likely, there will be a ceasefire at that point. And I would be much more comfortable with um, a, a Democratic administration than a Trump administration uh, when it comes to rebuilding Gaza and 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 it, I, you're you're making a mistake to assume that it's just the one guy making a decision. Trump making it. It's the coalitions that they bring and the people that can pressure look, them on Israel. And on that, Israel, like you know, if the, if there's st no ceasefire by November sixth of this year, I don't think it's illogical to say uh, that Trump is better. If that's the one issue you're only going to vote on, then that's the one issue you're going to vote on. Um, but even that the the. The party that just had 40 signatories, including the the former Speaker of the House, call to cease aid, military aid to Israel is the Democratic Party. And, it, like, none of that would matter if Trump were in office. None of that would matter. 
he wouldn't care. And in fact, he might draw. I mean, mean, it's there's also an argument that if you had uh, 40 or 50 or 100 Democrats calling for a ceasefire, that Trump uh, at that point um, could not. Right. Because he also cares about his Republican coalition at that point. Uh, So I don't know. Um, But if you if you narrow it down to um, uh, that one issue, that's you're getting, you know, relatively close to where it makes sense. But I don't think that's going to be the the case by then. I would imagine I would be shot. Um, Oh, this is we missed this, but this is awesome. Uh, John Stewart, a little late to it. We had Lena Khan on the show six years ago. I think it was right. Uh, but John Stewart had Lena Khan on his, um, uh, on the daily show. Mm-hmm. What does he, he do? He does one day a week. He does one day a week now. God. Yeah. And he had, uh, John Stewart had, uh, Lena Khan on the daily show. And this is fascinating. Um, again, it shows the power of monopoly. <laughs> Uh, on some level. Um, and what happens when you have a company that has amassed such fortunes? Um, it is perfectly, uh, and, and what's also amazing juxtaposition is compare like what Apple is censoring versus like what Spotify doesn't censor. But here is uh, John Stewart with uh, Lena Khan. Again, we had her on uh, six years ago, five years ago. Uh, but uh, he's he's catching on. They're saying this new algorithm, this new uh, uh, kind of machine learning model called AI, that's going to transform every aspect Pause of for one American second. life. Uh, also, uh, seeing as how things that uh, were pre-existing. Uh, huh. n- nice mugs. Oh, nice yeah. mugs you got there. Go ahead. Cease and desist. In the American economies. It's already being consolidated. Apple has bought 30... AI models, Microsoft is probably bought, Google has bought, they all buy AI startups and put them behind their paywall. And they're already having an arms race to see who will be either the monopoly or this will be an oligopoly. I got to tell you, I wanted to have you on a podcast and Apple asked us not to do it, to have you. They, They literally said, please don't talk to her having nothing to do with what you do for a living. I think they just... <laughs> I didn't think they cared for you, is what happened. <laughs> they, they, wouldn't, they, didn't, they wouldn't let us do even that dumb thing we just did in the first act on AI. Like, what is that sensitivity? Why are they so afraid to even have these conversations out in the public sphere? I think it just shows one of the dangers of what happens when you concentrate so much power and so much decision making in a small number of companies. I mean, going back all the way to the founding, there was a recognition that in the same way that you need the Constitution to create checks and balances in our political sphere, you also needed the antitrust and anti-monopoly laws to safeguard against concentration of economic power because you don't want an autocrat of trade in the same way that you don't want a monarch. But then it took them. I mean, it wasn't until the Sherman Act in what eighteen ninety. Okay. We don't. And, and so, um, great exchange. And um, it's fascinating to me that you have Apple will censor and keep uh, someone from having a uh, the FTC chair on to talk about antitrust, where uh, Spotify is saying to their big uh, money uh, maker, "Hey, man." Bring on any lunatic you want uh, to put out any BS you want, and um, we're just going to keep uh, raking in the, the dough. I mean, that's the uh, that's a, obviously a big problem there. And I will say that, like you know, um, I've been in. Uh, I've ha- I, I was actually invited to a uh, meeting between some uh, liaisons with uh, Google and uh, myself and one other very big uh who is the basically the ceo and also host of a very big um uh show on there i think you're quite familiar Mm -hmm. with it probably i mean no i know for a fact you are and um they were like uh what should we know about um you know uh 
about uh, the, the the Democrats maybe coming in. I can't remember when this was. Um, and uh, maybe it was even pre twenty sixteen actually, and uh, because there are there hearings about antitrust, and I was like, well, I got to tell you, like, I hope they break your company into a bunch of different pieces. <laughs> no, I appreciate the money that we make from you, but and this guy was like, I'll come and testify. And be willing to uh, say that they shouldn't do this. This is all BS. I actually remember the guy going, like, I've read Bat Stoller. It's not a big deal. And I was like, well, I, this is where I probably, this is probably the last time I'd be at one of these conversations because I'm obviously not telling you guys uh, what you want to hear. But um, Hey, I'll, I'm happy with where we're at. Uh, I mean. Uh, but it was, it, was pretty, uh, it was pretty funny to me. Pretty illuminating. But, I mean, what this, just to give people a sense of what this suit is about, it's basically uh, that, you know, how when you're sending a message from your iPhone that comes up green, if somebody else doesn't have an iPhone, um, the green, uh, those green texts don't have encryption on them. And that is uh, Apple basically trying to make it more difficult for you to communicate with people who do not have other iPhones, right? And so that is considered, according to Lena Khan in this lawsuit, an anti-competitive monopoly pra monopolistic practice. And, um, you know, there's also uh, other, uh, th this pairs very well with her suit against Go uh, Google, I think, right? Um, on, on antitrust grounds, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe I'm, I'm conflating the two. Well, but the, the Google suit is more of like a, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, well, it, it's all anti-competitive stuff, I guess. Yeah. Right, right. But, but um, this uh, this lawsuit could potentially make um, app force Apple to encrypt all of this and to make the user experience more applicable for uh, when you're trying to communicate with people who have different branded phones. Um, but they're, know, the they're trying the to argue, iPhone 15 yeah. has uh, the USC uh, USB C connectors. I think it's in Europe. They basically said you can't. Yeah, you can't do this. Yeah, you, you're, you're it's, it's absurd. Um but but they need to they're arguing right publicly that this is going to affect their ability to make uh, their data uh, more secure <laughs> for its users. And it's like, well, why don't you just encrypt all of it, all communications, all communications and standardize it. But that's um, that's that's what they're at least arguing for uh, in front of uh, uh, the, the court. Um, South Carolina won the. Um uh, NCAA uh, women's tournament last night. Yes. Are you aware of that? Yes. I watched the game. It was incredible. Caitlin Clark came out firing. She had a record-breaking first quarter. But South Carolina, just as a team, you could see size and physicality. Um, there was the, Iowa just did not uh, match up well, and it really is kind of a one-person show over there. So they, they deserved it. An undefeated season finished perfectly. On Saturday, before uh, the game game was on Sunday, um, head coach of uh, University of South Carolina women's basketball team, Don Staley, is doing uh, the press conference, as they will do, uh, in the lead up to the final of the final four. And um, I think she was annoyed at the question uh, because, like, you're sort of why are you bringing this up at well, this point but the, the guy who asked is a right wing writer so outkick is a right wing uh online sports publication yeah, clay travis is uh yeah uh vertical yep and uh but good for her she did not uh she did not back down she took the bait and then she uh chomped on the line and bit the line in half and swam away um uh, maybe i Played that metaphor out too much, but here's Don Staley. Good for her. Dan Zakrzewski, Outkick coach. You just talked about you know what a massive weekend this is, obviously for women's basketball, women's sports in general. One of the major issues facing women's sports right now is the debate discussion topic about the inclusion of transgender athletes, biological males in women's sports. I was wondering. Pause it for one second. Me. Let me just also correct one thing. This is not one of the biggest issues no. facing women's sports at all. Not even remotely. And you're about to hear from the top of the top of the game, who's basically say, who's going to basically say, like, this is not, uh, you're out of, you're just, you're out of your mind. I mean, and he's this also isn't... asking this the day before the biggest, the championship game for her. But it shows just how sort of like 
creepy and um and thirsty and um i don't know pesty these right wingers are with this this is not the biggest thing facing uh women's sports not even by a, a, like a mile but go ahead one of the major issues facing women's sports right now is the debate discussion topic about the inclusion of transgender athletes biological males in women's sports i was wondering if you would tell me your position on that issue um Damn, you got deep on me, didn't you? I, I, I'm on the, I mean, I'm on the, the opinion of, of, if you're a woman, you should play. If you consider yourself a woman or, and you want to play sports or, or vice versa, you should be able to play. That's that's my opinion. You want me to go deeper? Do you do you think uh, transgender women should be able to participate? That, in, that, that's your question. You want basketball. me to ask? I mean, you want to ask? So I'll I'll give you that. Yes, yes. So now, the barnstorm of people are going to flood my timeline and be a distraction to me on one of the biggest uh, days of 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 our game. And I'm okay with that. I really am. In other words, go F yourself, you uh, bigot. Yeah. Good for her. Good for her. I mean, and, and, and she understood exactly what he was trying to do there, too. Oh, absolutely. 100%. And, I mean, with, this was a debate. Ugh, debate. But, uh, I mean, a real, uh, a really trumped up um, fixation from the right wing around this time last year, actually. Where it's this, obs uh, you know, uh, whether it be Riley Gaines, who tied with an, a trans swimmer for fourth, I think that was fifth, oh, I'm so sorry, and was deeply, deeply upset that this was some sort of infringement um, on her right to compete. The reality is, is that, I mean, women's basketball, too, they are acutely aware of gender discrimination and other forms of discrimination. Um, uh, Brittany Griner is an openly LGBTQ uh, famous WNBA player. There are other very famous gay WNBA players who have faced discrimination. And um, that, I think, has fostered a really inclusive mentality within the sport where they understand that this is just another way to demonize trans people and make particularly trans women into this uh, uh, kind of in their view, bastardization of femininity. Uh, and it's just really uh, odd, odd too, by the way, that they never focus on it in the reverse because they, for this one moment, right-wingers have decided that they care about women's sports. For the rest of time, they've said that it's stupid, that they shouldn't get paid 100%. anything, that the market should decide it. But now they've decided that they want to focus, laser focus, and gatekeep whether or not but trans women can participate. The beauty of this exchange is it encapsulates all of that the idea that you are a sports writer and you have an opportunity to ask a question of is she the most winningness uh winningness uh winning -ist, um i believe college, so uh, but she's uh, won the championship two out yeah, of the last three years a women's college basketball uh coach maybe in history close maybe i mean in terms of like uh at least in the modern era right and as a player and coach like she's okay. one of the most decorated you have an opportunity to ask her a question the uh day before she's facing off in the finals against arguably the most popular or well-known um uh uh college women's basketball player ever ever and uh, i don't even think it's arguable yeah and this is the question you ask like it is so indicative of like if you really care about women's sports why would you ask that question yeah like if you were actually emotionally invested and intellectually invested in women's sports why would you ask that question you're not you're not even as a sports writer or whatever it is that they supposedly do totally. over there you're you're not yeah. I and mean, this is what's so, so perfect about that exchange because 
it, it, it's all wrapped up in that. It shows how you don't care. It shows yeah. how you really don't care. And she was he was just trying to get a gotcha, which she recognized and clocked immediately. But this is the thing, is that we are not, you know, a year out from this faux controversy, we've realized how there's actually zero impact on any of this amidst this incredibly exciting explosion of interest in women's basketball. That's not anywhere near what they're talking about, nope. what actually women in sports are talking about. And when you do ask them, they say, yeah, we'd love to include them because there are a lot of physical, tall women, cis women that already participate a trans woman who may be physical or also tall would not be in any way difference a difference on the on the floor and you could see it i mean some of those south carolina women were incredibly strong but they but it it punctures again and then why there's always that focus on trans women versus trans men the idea that one if like if you're a biological male why would you want to become a wim woman i mean they're lesser and also just this notion of who's really w feminine who's really a woman the right and right-wing men in particular re get off on gatekeeping that kind of thing um and it just it shows you don't really think that trans girls and women are trans girls and women and if you're really concerned about physical differences okay again Yao Ming was uh, much taller than everybody. If you want, if everyone was so concerned about physical differences, you could make height requirements on different basketball players. Okay, but putting that aside, um, if you really are concerned about these physical differences for trans athletes, trans women participating in women's sports, it's really simple. Allow for patients and their doctors when they are minors to uh, with the consulting doctors and physicians and therapists undergo gender affirming care where hormones will solve all of this stuff and there's nothing for these freaks to worry about but it's really not about that it's just about saying well they're not really women are they um let's go to uh let's talk about the uh clips um sure wait I, I'm, I, I don't know the science in this. Maybe you guys can help me out. This is um, Right Side Broadcasting Network. Uh, Brian Glenn, who is uh, apparently dates, uh, what's her face? Uh, Audrey Taylor. Oh my gosh. Um, wow, that's he's talking about like? the eclipse um, and may have like somehow <laughs> been practicing looking into the uh, sun. Um, <laughs> this uh, uh, apparently the... Uh, Total Eclipse is going to have some scientific uh, implications that I wasn't aware of. Uh, let's go to Dr. Brian Glenn. He's not a doctor. I want you guys to have a fantastic weekend, and here's why. This might be the last normal weekend that we have for quite some time. I mean, we've got this solar eclipse on Monday, this very rare solar eclipse. Who knows what the fallout from that will be. Plus, that will be combined with several earthquakes. We've already seen a few already. And why not uh, sprinkle in this infestation of locusts uh, that have been a dormant for years and all of a sudden will attack mankind? So why not? Oh, then throw in Joe Biden trying to get into a war with Iran for whatever reason he wants to do that. So on that note, have a great weekend. We'll see you next week, or maybe not. I'm so he's talking about the cicadas, the cicadas that are emerging this year? Are the cicadas coming this year? They I come every seven so. years, right? I believe so. I believe it's time for their cycle. Or, or it's God telling us that DEI is infecting every part of our lives. I mean, you know, I need a Mr. Forehead there who could eclipse the sun just by standing in front of it, honestly. To oh, tell us what's going on. The cicadas come out every 13 or 17 years. Um, so the cicadas are coming out. No um, no relationship to the eclipse. Uh, um, are you sure? No. But uh, I'm pretty sure they're not going to impact the, um, the uh, earthquakes. I mean, um, there was... We had an earthquake the other day. We did. Was that because the eclipse is coming? That must be what it no, is. No, no, but I mean, no. God, why can't you figure this out? Those things are not causing the other. They're connected because something else is happening up on high. Oh, I don't know. Well, let's check in with uh, the mayor, uh, America's mayor, 
Uh, former mayor of New York, now a uh, broke guy doing a, a, a radio program and uh, hawking God knows what. Um, here he is explaining what's really going on with uh, the earthquake. Communist state of New York. Uh, and then we were in the state of Connecticut, and we just escaped all of the earthquakes. And uh, then we got to Massachusetts, which probably had some earthquakes. And we got to New Hampshire with no earthquakes, which is telling me that somebody's sending us a message. The communist states are getting earthquakes. And I think that's what the, I think, look at California. You can't have more, you can't have more earthquakes than California. You want to figure out why? We left the... Oh, uh, uh, what? Wasn't he the mayor of that communist city, New York? Not when it was communist. Com communist. Pre-communist. Gotcha. Um, That's when the fault lines reoriented. You know... <laughs> when Rudy left office. Scoundrel's last uh, refuge is what? Is patriotism, is that they said? Or uh, maybe, I guess, fundamental religion. I mean, this guy... This guy was uh, divorced, like, what, two or three times? I don't want to get that wrong, because I know how uh, how these... Um, these pious guys get very uptight if you, you say how many times they've been divorced and you get it wrong. But um, uh, in addition to marrying his cousin or uh, dating his cousin, he also uh, cheated on, I think, both his wives. And I think he cheated on his last one uh, by using the, um, the apartment that was donated to first responders. And, and the reporting was that the reason why Rudy Giuliani put the uh, emergency response center in World Trade Center building number seven, which obviously became in inoperable. There was a lot of, um, of gas in that building. They were stored a lot of tanks of, uh, of gas there. Um, he was begged not to do it. I think it was by Bratton, I want to say. Uh, do it, put it in Brooklyn. Why would you put it next to like one of the more obvious targets in downtown? Uh, Which had been targeted before. Yes, in 93. And, um, but he needed a place to uh, hook, he needed a bachelor pad hookup <laughs> place. And that's what it was. So how do we know that God is not punishing the entire state of New York for because of just like the breadth of Rudy Giuliani's uh, sins? If you're gonna if you're gonna vote for Rudy Giuliani, uh, then I'm giving you all an earthquake. <laughs> and I'm gonna it's gonna take me a while because I can't, you know, these things they take time. These plates, you know, you can't just press a button. You gotta, but yeah, that's probably what God was doing, I, yeah. punishing us for uh, Rudy Giuliani. Incidentally, he mentioned New Hampshire. Um, I went in 2008 to a Rudy Giuliani, um, New Hampshire rally. And I think it might still be, uh, on YouTube somewhere. And it was about seven people. Mm. Um, and it was hilarious. They hate him in New Hampshire. Well, it's cause he's from one of those communist states. Yep. Before he'd renounced communism. Um, Let's see if there's anything else here we got. Hmm. I mean, this Warren, what, what? Bill Maher is yeah, let's so, do this. so, this, gosh, I'll never be able to watch a clip of Club Random without thinking about Tim Heidecker's parody. Of Tim it. Heidecker's parody of uh, the Bill Maher uh, Club Random uh, show is actually uh, so much better than the, the what it parodies. But yes, it's amazing. just like the amount of alcohol that is on the table. It's just too much, too many bottles. The amount, the compulsive need he needs to be smoking the entire time, the- Did you hear the story about Steve-O? Yes, yes. He apparently wouldn't- uh, Steve-O has uh, yes. been sober for, I think, uh, I don't 16 know how many, years. 16 years, and uh, he asked, uh, Bill Maher asked him to come on the show, and uh, Steve-O said, yeah, but I just don't want you to smoke pot in front of me. Because, you know, I'm, I'm sober. I don't want to mess with that. And Bill Maher was like, nope, no, not going to have you on. 
Steve-O from, uh, from Jackass. And, yeah. and, and so, like, but the, and the, just the level of arrogance that he per, uh, displays and disinterest in what his guests have to say if it doesn't comport exactly with what he's trying to get across. So Here he is Tim uh, nailed that. with actor Billy D. Williams. Um, and, uh, <laughs> well... <laughs> Here is uh, Williams not understanding, uh, you know, uh, here are two old guys who don't understand uh, how times have changed. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, Olivier sure. was more, more physical. Okay. In fact, he got criticized a lot for being physical and doing things with his voice. That was a bit outrageous. Wow. Um, but when he did Othello, I fell out laughing. He stuck his ass out and he mm -hmm. walked, walked around <laughs> with his ass. Problematic. You know, it was like, you know, because black people are supposed to have oh, big I, asses. Right? I understand. How I fell out boy, laughing. And, I thought and it was, Bradley Cooper thinks he's got a problem <laughs> with the nose. I thought it was hysterical. <laughs> and, I and loved it. it. I loved it. But see, I love that kind of stuff. Black yes. I big love, asses? Who doesn't? No, no. No, I know. Yeah. I, I agree. Okay. But, but here's the thing. Today, I mean, they would never let you do that. Why? Blackface? Why you, not? Because... You should do it. That's maybe... That's your point of view. You should, that, if you're that, an that, actor, you should do anything you want to do. I. That's a great point of view, but the theater would be bombed. Oh, I mean, Muley and I used to talk about this all the time. Pause it for Muley. one second. I mean, here's the thing. Uh, yeah, people would have a problem with it. People would have a problem. But the theater would not be bombed. Um, this is like the fundamental sort of like, you know, problem that, well, that that a guy like Bill Maher has. This notion of like, th this is terrorism. There's actually like, we have had places bombed in this country by uh, right-wing reactionaries. But not by people who are. They're, they would. Would people protest? Yes. Would they? Um, would they say like you shouldn't do this? We're you know we were gonna we're gonna boycott the 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 person who did this. You know what's the justification for this? Yeah, that would definitely happen. Would people be outraged? Without a doubt. But nobody would bomb it. I know he's supposedly joking. And uh, but he does genuinely believe he is under siege uh, because of these things. And he's just so kind and, of. And why does why did he say it's problematic for Olivier to be sticking out his butt? Right. Why did he say that? He had the exact same reaction. Right. But then Billy D. Williams says, oh, I'd love to see blackface. And then he gets to be like a little bit tickled pink because he didn't have to say it. Right. Go ahead. Theater would be bombed. Oh, I mean, Muley and I used to talk about this all the time. Muley was the one who was the first person that I worked with in those years who said to me, if whatever, as an actor, you should be able to do whatever you think you can do, you should be able to do it. But again, not to bring up your sore point, but you actually lived in a period where you couldn't do that. Where you couldn't that play the part matter. you should have played, but it didn't matter. I, the point is, and that's a great attitude, but it still did happen. No, of course it happened. Okay, I mean, but but the fact is that you discuss it. Anybody right. can talk about it. Means that it wasn't happening. But I mean, but and the Paul comes from an era. You don't go through life feeling like I'm a victim. Correct. I couldn't agree with that more. <laughs> I, I, I'm just. I mean, I refuse yeah, to go through life. It's, no, it's saying, perfectly. It, it is perfectly fine for Billy D. Williams to uh, not want to go through life as a victim. And I should say there is 100 percent no reason for Bill Maher to go th think that he's gone through life as a victim. That guy has skated through life in a way that you can't even begin to understand. Um, but it's perfectly fine as an individual. But as a society to say, and you know, I mean, Billy D. Williams can have his opinion and his, uh, it, and and say like it, it was no big deal for me that I wasn't able to play uh, parts or that I wasn't available, you know, to have the success I would have had had I been white or really, frankly, even in this era. I mean, if Billy D. Williams was twenty four today, not eighty seven or thirty, his career would be vastly different. He'd have a lot more opportunities, and. 
uh, and it's fine. He, for him, he was one of the lucky ones. But yep. for every Billy D. Williams, there was like 12 other Billy D. Williams who should have had more success, but couldn't because there was no access. Yeah. And then he just returns, I guess, to everyone else's. They're all snowflakes, the kids these, these days. Do people, of course. Do people not get sick of that kind of conversation? I mean, you can hear that with your drunk uncle on Thanksgiving. Why does anyone want to hear a wealthy comedian making this argument? And it's just incredible to me. These are the, it's every, every generation. Every generation thinks the one b b uh, beneath it is soft or silly or not interested in uh you know uh being a good capitalist and they care too much about gay rights or gaza or whatever the case is and there's just never a self-reflection from once once people age out of that where it's like oh they said that about us they said that about of us of course it's a tale as old as time of course it is really just old people who are getting old and can't can't handle it the, the idea that they're no longer, their antiquated perspective on the world is no longer in, you know, part of the zeitgeist. And it's sometimes hard to accept. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, read some IMs when we get out of here. We'll, we'll save some stuff for tomorrow. Um, Far Twain, we're having some big debates in Alaska about education funding. The right is saying throwing money at schools is a waste and won't improve anything. Yet we have a school in rural Alaska that is on honey buckets and has zero running water due to frozen lines and not having the money to fix them. Our public schools are crumbling, and the reason we won't get adequate funding is our governor, right-wing legislators, have a hard-on for charter schools. Um, Snarkorsky. Uh... At the Big Ten tournament, my wife, who played uh, women's sports back when we were just getting started and the girls had to buy their own uniforms, said that every woman of a certain age from Iowa was there with her partner wearing a Title uh, IX shirt. She was only slightly exaggerating. Dizzy in the fizzle. The coach of South Carolina understands that the discrimination against trans women doesn't stop uh, at them. It'll come for black women next. How many people called Angel Reese a man or Serena, uh, Serena Williams? Oh, yes. Well, she's it, that's a, a great point. Um, the level of vitriol towards black women in uh, in this discourse as well um, is, I think, probably part of why she understands, understands this. We'll talk about this on the SVN uh, very soon. Hunks me off. Thanks for the advice uh, for what to do if I ever become the owner of a large amount of raccoons poop. Well, I, I, my advice would be to never own any. Tomo Flink. Uh, happy Fun Day Monday, folks. Here in Britain, there are two local elections in some places on 2nd of May. There are local elections in some places on the 2nd of May, including the London mayoral election. The Tories pulled down an attack ad about crime in London after they got caught out trying to pass off footage of New York City as footage of London. Also, Liz Truss is releasing a book called 10 Years to Save the West. Jonathan Armstead. Guys, today was a best of candidate. I put a hold on the book from my local library and I'm four in line to get it. Told a pal about it. The stuff blew my mind. Nice. Militant apathy. Um, just weird as F. Absolutely creep. The kind of dude who claims to be worried about grooming and men in women's bathrooms, but will scan left and turn and right when they are standing at a urinal. I also start to feel... Okay. I need to read that. Axel Red. I think Dr. Grace Howard, who recently wrote The Pregnancy Police, Conceiving Crime, Arresting Personhood, would be an interesting guest for the show. Just write that down. Dr. Grace Howard. We'll look into that. Tyne. Tim Pool is a horrible little goblin. This upsets me because normally I find goblins cute and amusing. This is apropos of nothing, but needs to be said. I doubt he has more than like four HP. Not sure I know what that means. Me but, uh, train boy. Patron scent of election subversion is my favorite Dead Kennedys album. Three more. Cliff Fiskel. Long-time listener. Hi, live chat friends. I was raised in Valparaiso, Indiana in the 70s and 80s. I'm just a year or so younger than Sam. My brother went to 
Valparaiso uh, University. Mm -hmm. I got out immediately after graduating high school, moved to Chicago. I can also confirm what it's like in those exurb areas. I have plenty of anecdotal stories. Two more. WTF Cody. They basically want other women to police women who they believe don't fit the idea of what they think a woman should be in society. There are also annual cicadas every two to five years. Oh, yeah, we got to get out there. All right, and the final I am of the day. The club random video of Grandpa Bill Maher with the guest Bella Thorne was exquisite. His anti-trans <sighs> rant makes her stop dead, and then he panics. I think that that was an older clip, but yeah, that did seem funny. Bradley, great job today. Matt in absentia. Emma. Great job today, folks. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar Somehow I lost my drive